Okay, hi everyone, good morning. It is 9 a.m. here in Vancouver. Thank you so much for joining us in our tutorial, All Things VAPs, which is done in collaboration with the amazing Sag Paul, who will be joining us remotely, you'll see him soon. Thank you so much for joining us and I hope you'll enjoy the next three hours with us. So maybe let's start with a quick introduction of ourselves. My name is Ilan. I'm a PhD candidate at Tel Aviv University and also a, a research intern at Google Tel Aviv. And I'll let Sayak introduce himself via Zoom. Um, All right. Can everyone see and hear me? Yeah, we can see and hear you. Hi, Sayak. Good evening. Yeah, uh, it's almost almost uh, the time for me to say good night from uh, India. But here we go. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sayak, and thanks uh, to Hila for visiting Vancouver in person and for being there to present our tutorial uh, in person. Uh, sorry, the visa issues are beyond my control. That's why I couldn't be present there. Uh, but I really would like to welcome you all. Uh, and I want to say a heartfelt thanks for stopping by our tutorial. My name is Sayak. I am one of the co-organizers for this tutorial. You will see me around, but virtually. I work on the diffusers team at Hugging Face. And of the work, I like to Binge watch suits uh, on Netflix. Uh, and yeah, Hila will walk you through uh, the rest of the logistical stuff, which is pretty important. And then we'll get right to uh, the main meat of uh, our tutorial. So, Hila, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Sayak. See you soon. OK. So, other than myself and Sayak, we're, we're going to have a guest speaker who we love very much and appreciate him uh, joining us. His name is Owen Mukadi. He just graduated his PhD from Tel Aviv University and is now a research lead at uh, Biotech AI. And now that we know everyone who's going to uh, be presenting in this tutorial, let's go over the content of the tutorial itself. Now we're doing a short introduction and some logistics. Um, then we're going to talk about attention in a jiffy, right? So we're going to understand attention before we try to probe it or explain it, which is kind of important. Then we're going to talk about how to probe vision transformers, how to explain uh, predictions by vision transformers, and how to use attention as an explanation, if possible, in some cases. Um, we're going to wrap it up with how to use attention for downstream tasks, which is image editing or text to image generation, which I'm sure will be exciting for all of us. And then we'll end with open questions and conclusions, which will hopefully jaunt your imagination for future works that are possible in the field because there are many, many open questions that I hope will be intriguing for all of us. So just a few logistics about the tutorial. We'll have multiple short breaks, so don't worry. It's not going to be three hours straight of you listening to us speak. Um, also, we love, love, love questions and discussions. So please feel free to leave your questions on Rocket Chat or approach during uh, the breaks. Or we do have a mic here for the people attending in person. Um, but the people on Zoom cannot hear you. So what we're going to do is we're going to have methodical breaks for questions. You're going to go ahead and approach the mic, ask the question. I'm going to repeat it for the people via Zoom and answer the question. And a very important disclaimer about this tutorial, like any other tutorial, right? We're covering a lot of ground in just three hours. It is entirely possible that we're missing some really important and nice works that have been published recently. Um, we're apologizing for that ahead of time. But if you do find that there's some work that is missing from us, our slides, we'd be happy to correct that error. Just email us, talk to us. It is entirely possible that we're missing some amazing work since there are so many works being published in this field. And not really trivial nowadays, but we think it's really important. So all the content of this tutorial is going to be posted uh, publicly for everyone to see including the slides, the demos, the code, everything is going to be available on our website. So you can go ahead and just scan the QR code. Everything is going to be available, open source, and as approachable as possible for you to be able to use uh, all of our materials and reproduce all of the results that we're showing you here. I'm seeing that people are taking pictures, so I'll give you one more second to do that. <laughs> Okay, at the end of each slide, we're going to have uh, a resource slide such that you can approach uh, all the papers that we presented, all the demos, all the code. Everything is going to be in the slides. So really no need to take pictures. 
once the tutorial is over, you can just go to, to the website and uh, check out the slides and, and uh, see everything there, all the content. Okay, let's get started. <laughs> so part one is an introduction to transformers. We're not really assuming any prior knowledge on anything. So I'm going to give a lot of intuitions as to how transformers work and how the attention mechanism works. And hopefully we'll all be on the same page once we're uh, up to the point of probing and explaining. So the overview of this part is as follows. First, we're going to talk about how the transformer was even, even born, right? So the transformer was born for NLP um, and it was born to replace recurrent neural networks. And then we're going to talk about the process of moving from RNNs to transformers and why that happened. Then we're going to talk about the star of this entire tutorial, right? The attention mechanism. I'm going to try to give you as many intuitions as possible. Right. So this uh, speaker status, we have like uh, two from uh, academia and five from industry, so that we have uh, more uh, diverse background. So okay. okay, I have no idea what just happened. So sorry for that. <laughs> okay, so as I said, I'm going to try to give you as much intuition as possible about attention, because I think it's going to be just the star of this tutorial and basically the star of any deep learning model you come across right nowadays, even generative models. Um, we're going to talk about why transformers have multiple attention heads, right? The beast with many heads. Um, then we're going to touch on positional encoding and why that is needed, especially for transformer encoders. And then we're going to talk about the transition from self-attention to cross-attention, because that's going to be very important when we touch on generative models. Okay, so ready? Let's go. So in the beginning, there were RNNs. So RNNs were the state-of-the-art architecture used for NLP models. And what RNNs do, they're recurrent neural networks. Um, and they fit their name, right? They uh, process the sequence or the words in the sentence, word by word, one word by one word. And as you see, we have a single architecture here, A, that is applied to each word in the sequence. And as you can see, the RNN takes the first word in the sentence, processes it, and outputs a hidden state H0. And then in the next step, we're going to take the next word in the sentence, the uh, hidden state that we had from the previous step, and calculate the next hidden state. And this is repeated until we've processed the entire sequence. Um, and this was kind of the state of the art uh, an RNN or variations of it, right? LSTMs, BILSTMs, these were the state of the art models used for NLP up until 2017, when attention is all you need came out. So let's try to understand the motivation of why not sticking to RNNs or what are the main issues with sticking with RNNs. So the first one is sequential processing. So as we said, RNNs process the input word by word, right? It's sequential. So in order to process the entire input, we have to process uh, everything word by word. So in order to process X1, we have to first process X0 and so on. So this process is very expensive in time, right? It takes a lot of time. And if you have a, a very long sequence, it's going to take a long time to process the entire sequence and obtain your final hidden state HD. So that's the first problem. That's a runtime problem. The second problem is localization. So if you think about it, once we reach time step T, the first time step, uh, X0 is very, very far from time step T. And researchers have shown that these RNNs suffer from um, localization where the uh, hidden state HT mostly depends on its closest neighbors. So therefore the uh, first hidden states or the first words are less influential on the output hidden state. Therefore we have some kind of a bias uh, that each hidden state is in influenced by the words that are closest to it. And then we fail to kind of attend to the information that is in the beginning of the sequence. And the last uh, shortcoming that RNNs have is single direction context, right? So X1 could only look at X0 when calculating its hidden state. X2 could only look at X1 and X0. So the context that we're getting is from a single direction of the input. Um, BIOSTMs kind of solve that when we process the information from both directions and then output a hidden state that is kind of a computation of both. But then each direction is limited just to that single direction. So we're not getting context from all over uh, the sequence as we would like to have. So these are actually the issues of RNNs that led to the birth of the transformer. So I'm sure you've all heard of uh, the paper Attention is All You Need, which was published in 2017 and really made a revolution in the deep learning world, starting from NLP and then expanding to other uh, domains. 
So as you can see, this architecture is actually really simple and clean, right? It maybe contains the most basic building blocks that we can think about in neural networks. So we have feed forward layers, um, skip connections and normalization layers. So everything here is really, really basic. A clean and simple architecture, which was kind of the selling point of attention is all you need, right? That's the title. You, all you need is just attention. And then the only logical units that are kind of interesting or maybe unique are those orange attention units. So as you can see, we have an encoder here, which is going to be the focus of this talk because we're talking about vision and mostly in vision, we're using the encoder information. And then we also have the decoder. Um, and then both of them have self-attention units that you can see here in orange. And the decoder also has a cross-attention unit. And observe that the cross-attention unit takes information from the encoder and incorporates it into the decoder. So we're going to talk later about what cross-attention is and how it's useful, specifically in vision. But let's first understand why transformers are so seminal in the deep learning field. Um, before transformers, we kind of had proprietary architectures for each one of the dif disciplines in deep learning. So computer vision had CNNs and NLP had RNNs and LSTMs and RL had their own you know, set of architectures and speech ha had their own set of architectures and translation their own set of architectures. So all those disciplines of the same main field of deep learning had their own proprietary architectures with their own inductive biases, right? And then once the transformer was published, it actually took over all disciplines. So slowly but surely, it kind of replaced all the discipline specific architectures. And it was shown that attention is really useful for all disciplines in deep learning. So this is why the transformer is so important and so seminal uh, in the research of deep learning, because it is simply applicable to any, almost any domain you can think about, right? So this is why this architecture is so important. Okay. So let's talk about what the transformer did solve. We saw some of the shortcomings of RNNs, right? Um, so instead of processing the information sequentially, the transformer processes all the information together, okay? So there's no sequential processing of token by token by token by token. And again, we're talking about encoders, okay? Not decoders during this entire talk. Um, the localization issue, <laughs> the localization issue was solved as well, since we can now process the entire sequence together and gain context from all other tokens in the sequence. And then single direction context was solved again, inherently with the attention mechanism since it processes all information at once, okay? So basically it solved the three maybe most prominent issues that RNN had. Um, it should be noted, and it is important to note, that attention was used before the transformers, okay? So attention did exist before the transformer was born, but it was mostly used to kind of connect information between the encoder and the decoder. So we had those RNNs, which were the heart of, of the models, those recurrent units, and then the attention was used as kind of a supporting mechanism to mitigate between the information uh, of the encoder and the decoder, right? So attention did exist, but it was minor. It wasn't the heart. Of, of the model. And then in attention is all you need, the authors basically said, you don't need any other architecture. You don't need any other building block. Attention is enough to cover all the operations that were previously performed by different uh, models. Okay, so now that we're done with the introduction and hopefully we understand why attention is so important, why transformers are so seminal to the field, let's talk about attention and what attention does. So the purpose of attention is to create contextualized representations for each input token. So that's a really long and maybe not so understandable sentence, but let's try to break it down. Say we have this input sentence, the cat sat on the mat and this cute sat, cat sat on a mat. Um, as humans, we know to contextualize each word in the sequence. So for example, the word the, the first word the on its own, has no real meaning. So as humans, we know to relate the first word the to the word cat. So this is contextualization. We know how to take information from different parts of the sentence and assign them to the word that we're interested in. So basically here we contextualize the word the with the word cat. And in the same way, we know how to contextualize the second word the with the word mat. So contextualization is something that is really natural to us as humans. And this is exactly what the attention mechanism does. So the goal of the attention mechanism is to take each one of these words, each one of these tokens, and create a representation that contains information from the other relevant parts of the sentence. 
Any questions so far? Feel free to go to the mic. Anything? Okay, super, everything's clear. So let's talk about how the attention mechanism does this intuitively. And again, this is a very, very intuitive mechanism. So I hope you'll agree with me by the time I finish this uh, intuitive explanation. So attention kind of works in a similar way to retrieval from databases. So we've all worked with databases and we know that they have three main entities, the queries, the keys, and the values. And then the queries are kind of like the question that we're running on the database, right? Find star where ID equals something, right? So the same thing applies to the attention mechanism. We want to create contextualized representation, say for the word the. We're going to run a query on the other words to find the words that are relevant to the word the, okay? And then the keys are just like the keys in the database. So the keys map the values. We can compare the queries to the keys and extract the values according to the comparison between the queries and the keys. So again, we're running a query, a question on the entire database. The query is compared to the keys. We extract the keys that are relevant to the query that we ran. And then we can obtain the values that correspond to the actual objects, okay? That correspond to our query. So this is exactly what the attention mechanism does. It takes our input sequence, which is marked here as X, and it maps it to queries, keys, and values using three linear projection matrices. So you have WQ, WK, and WV, which map the input sequence to the queries, the keys, and the values. And then the attention calculation is done in two steps. The first step is to actually extract the value, the, the uh, other uh, tokens that are relevant to the current token, right? So as I said, we calculate a query, a key, and a value for each token in the sentence. For example, here, the sentence is just thinking machines. So we have query one for thinking, query two for machines, key one for thinking, key, one, key two for machines, and value one for thinking, value one for machines. Now, our goal is to extract the keys that are relevant to the query that we're running right now. Say we're running the query for the word thinking. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to assess how relevant each one of the words is to the word thinking. So this is going to be done by a dot product between the query and the key of each one of the tokens. So query one times key one actually represents the attention score of thinking with regards to itself. How much thinking is influential on itself, okay? And then query one times key two is going to reflect how influential the word machine is on the word thinking, okay? So these are actually the attention scores that we're calculating. These attention scores are kind of like relevance scores, how much each token is relevant to the current token that we're processing. And this is done mathematically using just a matrix multiplication of the queries and the keys. And this is normalized by softmax such that all these values sum to one. As you can see here, after the softmax, uh, both the values, both attention values sum to one. Okay, so we can see here that for example, the word thinking is going to influ be, be influenced by mostly itself and machines is not going to have a lot of influence on the word thinking, okay? So after we've calculated these attention scores, we turn to actually do the contextualization, okay? So the, context the contextualization is done by taking a, a linear combination of these words weighted by the attention values. So the actual contextualization is going to be taking value one and multiplying it by uh, the attention score of, of the first token and taking value two and multiplying it by the attention score of, uh, of, the, second, uh, of the second token machines. Okay, and then th this is the entire, uh, the entire attention mechanism calculation. So there's the attention score calculation here, the softmax of the queries times the keys, and then we multiply that by the values such that now thinking is going to be a linear combination of thinking and machines and the linear combination is scaled by the attention values. Any questions so far? Yeah, go ahead, go to the mic. What is the K? Oh, DK. DK is the dimensionality of the vector. So it's just a normalization for numeric stability. It's not really critical for the mechanism itself. Other questions? Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I would like to know, so uh, is, is, it, is it necessary for the Q and the K and the B to be a unit vector? 
Unit vectors? Yeah. Oh no, they're not unit vectors. The, the, the red, uh, the tension score and Okay, so the attention scores are actually normalized using the softmax. So for each one of the tokens, we're going to have a distribution defined over the other tokens, such that this distribution is going to define how much information we're going to take from each one of the tokens. Okay. So this entire operation that we've just described of the attention mechanism doesn't happen just once. It happens H times. So the attention mechanism is actually the beast with many heads, right? This is a term uh, that uh, was first uh, placed by Jay Alomar, which, by the way, uh, some of these visualizations are taken from his excellent blog, The Illustrated Transformer, which I highly recommend. Um, so we're, we're doing this attention operation not just once, but H times for H attention head. And then we might wonder, why do we need different attention heads? Why isn't it enough to just have one attention head? So I'm going to give you two intuitions as to why we need multiple attention heads. The first one is, as we said, we use softmax on the attention values, right? And then softmax is a very polarizing function. It leaves most of the values close to zero, and then a very, very sparse amount of the values are going to get a, a score that is not zero, right? So the actual contextualization is limited in that way, right? So we're going to take context from one, maybe two other tokens, if we want to create rich representations, we do want to be able to take context from a lot of the other information in the input. And then we can think about each attention head as performing different functionalities. And that's the second intuition. So in CNNs, we had kernels, right? And we know that each kernel kind of performed or learned to perform its own task. So you can think about the attention heads in a very similar way. Each attention head can learn a different functionality. So we can have some attention heads referring to shapes, colors, textures in uh, deeper layers, maybe more semantic features, right? Searching for something in the image. So we have different attention heads and each attention head has its own functionality. And then let's talk about how practically this is done in the attention mechanism. So we have our input X thinking machines, as we said before. Uh, we split the input into eight heads and each head calculates its own queries, keys and values, meaning each head will compute its own attention mechanism. And then after we compute the uh, result of the attention for each one of the heads, we concatenate everything to kind of a super attention result, right? That is constructed of all the attention heads. And then to produce the final output, we just multiply that by a linear layer uh, WO here and obtain the final output of the attention mechanism, okay? So this is the entire attention mechanism. And if you have any questions, please feel free. It's a great point. So yeah, just approach it, Mike. Yeah, no. Oh, oh, no, not not five words, five words, five words. You're splitting the uh, dimension of the embedding of each word. Oh, so, okay, so in the embedding dimension. yeah, in the embedding, the splitting is done in the embedding dimension. So each head will have a, a slice of dk, which is the dimension, uh, split by h, and then yeah. Okay, so each head sees like part of the whole context. Yeah, you can think about it as each head seeing part of the whole context, but then you do have linear projections mapping. You can think about it as linear projections mapping the input to each one of the heads. Basically, what you're doing is you're taking the input, having eight uh, projections for the queries, keys, and values for each one of the heads, calculating the result, concatenating it, and then projecting it again such that you are return to your original uh, original representation or original dimensionality. So I hope that's clear. Thank you. OK. So this was the entire description of the attention mechanism. Hopefully, you're convinced that it's intuitive. It takes some time. If this, if this is the first time you're seeing attention, it takes some time to kind of feel it and feel the intuition in your bones. But I assure you, if you work with attention enough, you'll see its beauty and, and its simplicity. I do get it that if this is the first time you, you see an attention, then it might be a bit confusing. But at the end of the day, the, uh, oh, sure, question. Uh, until you reach the mic, at the end of the day, the attention mechanism is really just information retrieval using very, very basic and intuitive operations. Yeah, and this is basically multiple times. What I don't understand is there, there are this intuition to scaling. Uh, so in the end, it's just the encoding. So why only three, two, K, Z? Why not four or 
<laughs> Why not four, five, six, or uh, 100? Um, I mean, I guess that it's just intuitively how we do things in information retrieval as well. So when we're running queries on a data set, what we're doing is we're taking the query that we want to run, the information that we want to extract, and then we're comparing it with the keys. And then we have queries and keys such that the queries and the keys, you can think about it as speaking in the same language, right? The queries and the keys are comparable to each other. And then the values are the actual information that we're extracting. So it is important to have queries and keys that are comparable because we don't want to compare the queries to the values directly. We kind of want the queries and the keys to speak the same language and the values to have the actual information that we're extracting, the actual contextualization. And you can think about it as you know, a hash table or, or any data set or database that you, that you can think about. This is how we, we do things as humans. So I guess it's just very intuitive to mo module the attention mechanism to do the same. Could you please repeat the questions for the for the remote? Oh yeah, yeah, of course. I'm so sorry, participants via Zoom. So sorry. Uh, the question was, why do we need queries, keys, and values? So why we do we need three entities, or and not four, or five, or six, or a million entities? Um, so then the answer was that this is just intuitively how we do things for databases as well. So I do see that we have another question. So if you want to discuss further, that's perfectly fine. But during the break. <laughs> Uh, but I do want to give other people the chance. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> we can talk during the break. I was wondering if you could talk a little about what makes the attention mechanism more general than even uh, MLP. That is, how does it, what in that device does it work with? Okay, so the question was um, what makes the attention mechanism so general and what inductive biases it removes? Um, so that's a really fantastic question because the attention mechanism, as I said before, is really general. And that's the strength of it. I mean, in comparison to MLPs, I think MLPs are probably really broad too, right? They don't have really inductive biases as far as I can think of uh, off the top of my head. But I will say that the attention mechanism has eliminated some inductive biases. So when we think about CNNs, how we process CNNs was in kernels, right? We had a kernel with a certain uh, a view that this view was the entire view that the kernel saw. So you couldn't kind of connect the upper left part of the image with the lower right part of the image. So you had an inductive bias of localization where the assumption was that as humans, we process information uh, by locality in images. And then the model did the same. And for RNNs, the inductive bias was that the information should be processed sequentially, uh, token by token. And this is not done by the transformer mechanism, by the attention mechanism. So it eliminated quite a lot of inductive biases that existed. And by the way, one of the criticisms of transformers, vision transformers and so on, is that they require more data in order to train effectively since they remove some of the inductive biases. So you can think of inductive biases as kind of hints that we're giving, cues that we're giving to the model on how to model the data uh, better. And then we took away some of these hints and some of these cues. So the model had to really work harder to uh, learn something meaningful. And therefore, they may require more data, even though I think there are some papers published on how to train vision transformers efficiently without a lot of data. So we have another question, but this is the last question that I'm going to take. Do you want to ask it? Yeah. Okay, so if I understand the question correctly, uh, the question was why do we need several attention heads and one attention head is not enough. And then uh, the, the best intuition that I can give to it is, as I said before, we can think about each attention head as having its own purpose. So as kernels and CNNs had their own purpose, we need the attention heads to have each one its own functionality and each one its own semantic task. And then they vary significantly from each other. Sayak will talk about probing uh, transformers in, in the next part of the tutorial. And then you'll see that there's significant variance between the different attention heads. So they have different meanings. And that makes sense. You can think about them as kind of logical units performing different semantic tasks on your input. 
Okay. So uh, moving on to positional encoding. So if you recall, the entire attention mechanism was based on matrix multiplications, right? We multiply the queries with the keys, but then this multiplication is not sensitive to the order of the tokens in the sentence, right? We could just shift and move around the tokens and the dot product will not be affected by that. But order is really actually important for encoders, okay? For decoders, there are papers showing that you can kind of uh, get rid of the positional encoding and there's an explanation for that. If you're interested in that, by the way, feel free to come and chat about it uh, during the break. But for encoders, it's really important to uh, have information about the order. Let's take a look at these two sentences that are comprised of the same tokens. She likes ice cream, he does not. He likes ice cream, she does not. To me, everyone likes ice cream, so <laughs> most sentences uh, contain a logical contradiction. But then these two sentences have very different meanings. In one of the sentences, she likes ice cream. And in the other sentence, she does not like ice cream. So if we're expecting the model to actually create contextualized representations that are meaningful, we need to give it information about the positions, right? It has to know the position of each one of the tokens. So what they did in the transformer architecture is that they added positional information you know, manually because it doesn't exist in the attention mechanism itself. So we have the input embedding kind of a vector for each one of the tokens in sequence. And what we're doing is we're just adding positional encoding, adding positional information. And this positional information is just added by summation, okay? So now each vector is going to represent both the token and is going to be added information about the position of the token, such that the attention mechanism can still be oblivious to location, but the representation of the vector has some information about the position, okay? Okay, so we covered self-attention so far. Let's move on to cross-attention. So cross-attention is used between the encoder and the decoder, such that the decoder needs to see information from the encoder, right, to make its predictions. But in the context of vision, we're usually talking about contextualization between two different modalities, usually image and text, okay? So what we have right now is an input of an image, which we want to add information from text, from the textual domain to. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the exact same attention mechanism that we've just discussed, only we're going to take the queries from the image and the keys and the values from the text, okay? So let's discuss the intuition that we talked about before. So we said the queries are kind of like the semantic questions, right, that we're asking. So what this mechanism will do is it will ask the semantic questions from the image and give the answers, oh, sorry, give the answers or the information to, for the contextualization from the text. So basically what we're doing when we're taking the queries from one domain and the keys and the values from another domain is we're taking the context or taking the information from the text and inserting it into the image. And the image is free to kind of ask the text or query the text on any semantic information that it sees fit. Okay, so this is the cross attention mechanism and we're a bit behind. Um, so this wraps up the first part of our tutorial. The papers that we discussed are basically just attention is all you need. And we've also mentioned uh, the great blog post, the illustrated transformer by Jed Alama. I really, really recommend reading it because I kind of skimmed through the entire attention mechanism and the entire transformer architecture. And I didn't really pay attention to the decoder at all. So if you're interested and want to read more, I really recommend this blog post, which some of my slides were based on. So thank you so much. This wraps up our first part of the tutorial. We're going to have a five minute break right now and then go back to the second part, probing. Feel free to come and ask questions, by the way. Um, I mean, you can just think about it as what we do initially is we're taking the text and mapping each one of the text tokens to its own vector presentation. And then adding the positional encoding is kind of like adding more information to that encoding. Then so the initial... Just addition, yeah. Just, just, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't understand why just addition. Why works well? You can think about it as just adding information to your vector. Think about it as 
maybe you have, okay, maybe that's the best intuition I can give. Think about the first k entries of the vector being dedicated to the information, this mass information, and then the last m entries being dedicated to the position. So that's kind of the same, right? You take the information, the semantic information about the surface. Yeah, I understand. And then they, uh, just, I, mean, I think the important is they are differentiated. Uh, of why just just differentiate? I mean, so just differentiate is important or? It is very important to add a position. Yeah. No other meaning. Is there any other meaning? I mean, you can think about replacing the addition with maybe um, dot product, or I'm not sure if people have tried that, but addition actually works pretty well. And you can think about it as just logically adding two different parts, two different semantic information. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that other classes Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are a few papers, actually one from my friend at Tel Aviv University, um, showing that uh, decoders don't need positional information. And basically the reason for that, probably, is because they're using, you know, a mass extension mechanism. So you know your, the position of your token according to the number of max tokens that you have. So, so that's the assumption. Yeah, it's, it's implicit. Yeah, so the model actually learns that on its own. But then for encoders, it's really, really important because you don't have max tokens, right? What's the name of the guy who wrote the illustrated J. Alamar. I hope I'm not pronouncing his name wrong. So J is J-A-Y. And then Alamar, I think, is A L M M A R. I think. I hope I'm not spelling his name wrong. But if you look for the illustrated transformers, it's, it's oh, the most the popular. Oh, okay. Yeah, if there's a link to any, everything, I yeah, we made sure of that. <laughs> Hi. No, no, unfortunately not, because this is actually not the focus of, of uh, this tutorial. We're not going, going to kind of deep dive into how transformers are implemented. Yeah, sorry for that. I have another question uh, related to position uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm a beginner, so I wonder, uh, we already put those words in a specific position. Why we have as child? Uh, yeah, because the attention mechanism itself, what it does is it actually just calculates dot products between pairs. And those dot products between pairs have no idea what the order is, right? You're, you're multiplying two matrices, so you have no information on the order. Basically, the, the dot products themselves just take one vector and another vector and multiply them. So you have no information on what comes where. And what comes where. Yeah. Uh, we have like multiple and uh, we, we want to calculate. Well, sorry, we, we have to return to the tutorial right now. I'm so sorry, guys. So sorry for waiting, and uh, the five minutes are up, and we do have a lot of ground to cover. Um, Okay, so for the guys on Zoom, can someone say if you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Oh, great, great, great. Okay, so the five minute break is over. I'm so sorry it was so, so short. So we're going to move on to the second part of the tutorial, which is uh, probing transformers. And uh, this part will be given by Sayak. So I'm just gonna play the recording. If you have any questions for Sayak, since he's not present here, Feel free to just join Rocket Chat, okay, and leave your questions there. And then I'm sure Sayak will be thrilled to answer your questions. So I'll just yield the floor to Virtual Sayak. Hello. Welcome to uh, part two of our tutorial, uh, where we will discuss how to group the few presentations learned by Shen Transformers 
and how to compare the representations uh, to the representations learned by convolutional neural networks uh, such as ResNets. Here's an overview uh, of the tools that we will use uh, in this section. We will start by discussing the idea of mean attention distance uh, uh, to discuss how uh, vision transformers learn global and local contexts, unlike uh, CNNs. Uh, then we will resort to centered kernel alignment uh, to be able to compare the representations learned by its uh, and ResNets. And finally, uh, we will discuss the role of skip connections uh, in vision transformers and ResNets. Uh, now, to set the context uh, right, uh, we I want to quickly discuss uh, what vision transformers are. Uh, at least the uh, uh, components, and for that, I'm going to have to shamelessly steal slides from Lucas Baird, uh, who is uh, one of the authors of Vision Transformers. Now, the main idea here uh, is to extract small patches uh, from in input images and feed them uh, to embedding layers to compute linear projections. And with those embeddings, uh, we basically prevent. Uh, another class embedding which is learnable, which is like extracting embedding from a CLS token uh, similar to BERT. And to those embeddings, we add position embeddings. And rest of the process is exactly the same for how you would do that uh, for, for, for the transformer and coded blocks uh, in NLP. So the key and insight uh, shared in the Shen Transformer paper was this the patchification part and how to compute embeddings uh, of those patches uh, and use, uh, uh, use the exact same transformer encoder architecture uh, for the image classification task. And similar to what we pull the representation uh, for, uh, associated uh, with the CLS token and then we feed that uh, to the classification M. Now, even with all the uh, classification numbers, how do we know uh, if this approach is effective at all uh, from a deeper uh, perspective. Because locality is important for computer vision uh, and uh, if, if, if you paid uh, attention to the earlier slide, you would have noticed that there's literally, there's little to no inductive bias present in a vision transformer uh, that will uh, help, that will help to learn locality in the first place. But at the same time, having a global context uh, is equally important, uh, especially for dense prediction tasks uh, like semantic segmentation, object detection, and so on. So how do grids uh, learn locality? Uh, and is there any similarity uh, in between the representations learned by uh, CNNs and bits? And what are uh, their repercussions even if there's little to no similarity? So uh, these are the two questions and that we will primarily focus on in this section. So our first tool of analysis uh, would be the mean attention distance investigated uh, in the initial vision transformer paper. Uh, and uh, MAD, uh, which is short for mean attention distance, is defined to be the geometric distance between two patches scaled by their attention values. So uh, a high MAD would denote that the distant patches receive high attention values, and low MAD would denote that uh, relatively close patches receive high attention values. Now, in the animation, uh, the row and the column of a, part, uh, of a particular patch is indicated uh, on the image, uh, and their geometric uh, distance is calculated by the uh, norm of the difference in between the uh, patches uh, times uh, the patch size. Now here are some interesting observations. If we closely uh, look at this plot, we will notice uh, that the lower uh, lower layers in uh, in the vision transformer network they tend to have a good mixture uh, of of local uh, and global contexts, uh, which we quantify uh, using mean attention distance introduced uh, earlier. And the higher layers within the network, they tend to focus mostly on the global context. 
And this behavior actually does not change much even when uh, we use a convolutional prior uh, by uh, using the feature maps computed uh, from a ResNet 50 and by making the vision transform network operate uh, on the feature maps computed using uh, ResNet 50. As we can see, uh, this behavior does not change much even when a con prior uh, is introduced in the network. Now, there seems to be a strong connection in between uh, mean attention distance, the pre-training data being used, along with the bit architecture uh, being used. So on the left hand side, I have a very deep vision transformer network that was pre-trained on the JFT 300 million dataset, uh, which was subsequently fine-tuned on the Imaginal 1K dataset. Uh, and on the right hand side, uh, I have the same uh, same bit model, but it was pre-trained only on the ImageNet 1K dataset, which is orders of uh, magnitude smaller uh, than the JFT 300 million dataset. Now this plot is slightly different uh, from what we saw earlier. Uh, here we are plotting the mean attention distance from individual attention heads uh, from different uh, transformer inverter blocks, and we we see that when when the pre-training dataset uh, is larger and when we are particularly using a deeper architecture uh, the network uh, the earlier earlier layers in the network they tend to learn uh, locality uh, but in absence of a larger uh, pre-training data set uh, the deeper bit model uh, they do not learn locality uh, at all which becomes evident uh, with the plot on the right hand side but if we if we change the uh, architecture uh, and the batch size, uh, this uh, the story changes. Right here on the left hand side, I I have a smaller uh, architecture which was pre-trained on the GFT 300 million dataset, and on the right hand side I have the same architecture but it was pre-trained on the ImageNet 1K dataset, and the behavior uh, remains the same here. Uh, so the batch size, so there's there's an interplay of batch size architecture uh, uh, and the uh, and the pre-training dataset uh, being used here. Uh, so that also uh, plays a direct role on how the mean attention uh, distance is going to develop uh, is going to be developed throughout the training process. So some observations at this point in time become evident is that without enough data, lower layers in bits, uh, they do not tend to learn locality. And this becomes quite evident in the deeper architectures of it. And with enough pre-training data, lower layers learn to input locality early, early on uh, in the network, uh, which could be an indicator uh, for good performance. And from the plots on uh, mean attention distance, uh, it, it also became evident uh, that bit layers have access to global information almost uniformly. And in the next couple of slides, we will discuss what are what are its repercussions. Now, here here the primary motivation is that CNNs do not uh, combine both local and global information like bits do. And does this lead to differences uh, in their representation space? Well, the spoiler is yes, it does. So here, here in this section, we will try to compare the representations learned by a vision transformer network and the representations learned by a, by an equal size uh, ResNet model. So to be able to do that, uh, we need a quantifiable, quantifiable way to measure the differences in between the representations uh, from neural architectures and we will use uh, the centered kernel alignment uh, and this paradigm uh, was introduced in the similarity of neural network representations revisited uh, paper so yeah and we will primarily uh, use centered kernel alignment for this uh, is because it has uh, two excellent properties uh, which is its invariant to orthogonal transformations of representations which is to say, even we permute the order of the neurons, uh, the CK will remain invariant to that. 
and it's also invariant to isotropic scaling. That is, when we scale each dimension uh, of the of the embedding single bounding, it still remains invariant. And here's here's a bit of a map. Uh, we start by uh, computing uh, the activations uh, from specific layers uh, within the network, and then we compute gram matrices uh, out of those uh, activations, and then we compute the Hilbert Schmidt independence criterion. Uh, and here's a more, more elaborate formulation of CK. So the normalization term there, it, it, it actually ensures that CK remains uh, invariant uh, to isotropic scaling. Now, let's get to the meat of it. Uh, so here we are doing a sort of intra-network comparison. Uh, on the upper hand, I have the CK heat map uh, for the vision transformer networks, two variants uh, of uh, vision transformer, and on the lower hand, I have two variants uh, of resonance. And two observations immediately become uh, uh, evident. Uh, one is uh, which show more uniform similarities uh, between both lower and higher layers, uh, whereas resonance show uniform similarities in like halves, uh, like uh, the representations computed from the lower layers uh, in resonance, they are very different from that of uh, the higher layers, but that's apparently not the case for vision transformers. They are much more uniform. Uh, and let's let's take it a step further, uh, where we try to do the internet for comparison, where we take representations computed from different layers uh, from a bit. Uh, and and exactly the same part for a resonant. And we see that bits, bits are able to compute uh, smaller features, uh, similar features as resonance, but with a smaller set of layers. And this probably leaves the space for vision transformers to learn more and more abstract features uh, during their training process. And bits also propagate features more faithfully uh, across layers uh, and Features across higher layers in which uh, vary significantly uh, uh, to that of the resonance. Now, uh, now I, I would like to discuss the role of skip connections and how, how that varies uh, in, in vision transformers uh, and resonance. Now, at this point in time, we saw that uh, which representation space is a uniform. And information from lower layers in bits is propagated to the higher layers much more faithfully than resonance. Now, how? That's the question we will try to uh, find, find an answer for. Now, the setup is, uh, is to plot the norm ratio of the following. So, ZI is basically uh, the representations uh, from the skip connection, and F of uh, ZI. Uh, is basically transformation uh, applied uh, applied to uh, applied on the uh, applied on ZI, which is basically the long branch, uh, such as the self attention block or the MLP block. So, yeah. Uh, and here's here's the plot where the zeroth index uh, denotes the CLS token. And the list of the indices on the x-axis uh, denote the spatial tokens. Now, if we look closely, uh, we, will, uh, we will observe a clear phase transition in between the CLS uh, and the spatial tokens, uh, where, where the first half, uh, where in the first half, skip connections propagate uh, the CLS token, which denotes a uh, high norm ratio. Uh, whereas, uh, whereas the uh, spatial tokens uh, get their major contributions uh, from the longer branch, uh, which 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 is denoted by uh, the lower norm ratio. And this is this is true for for the first half of the network, but this gets exactly reversed uh, uh, in the uh, later half of the network, where skip connections propagate the spatial tokens uh, uh, more. Now, here's a comparative plot uh, uh, in between the role of the skip connections uh, in bits and resonance. 
And skip connections actually behave very differently in bits uh, and resonance. And overall, we, we observe uh, uh, low norm ratios uh, as far as resonance are uh, concerned. So this kind of this kind of indicates that uh, skip connections play uh, a much more influential influential role uh, in modeling and propagating the presentations across different layers in bits than uh, than they do uh, in resonance. And if we start removing the skip connections, uh, it, it tends to disrupt the uniformity of the representation space in bits. Like if we remove the skip connection from uh, first uh, transform block, probably it does not disrupt much. But if we start removing it uh, from a higher, higher end, then uh, the uniformity gets immediately disrupted. Now, this is probably a bit out of scope uh, for this tutorial, uh, but its uniform representation structure also impacts robustness uh, as far as robustness uh, benchmarks are concerned in computer vision. Uh, robustness uh, with respect to corruption, robustness with respect to natural adversarial examples, and so on. Now, here's a list of the resources uh, that we discussed, and as a further reading, I welcome you to check out the last paper uh, which has got lots of cool visuals and I also welcome you to check out the mean attention distance collab notebook and I encourage you to try out uh, different mission transformer networks uh, and investigating their mean attention distances. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much Zach for this interesting uh, overview of attention probing. Uh, we'll take another five minute break and then we'll get right back to explaining. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, you can ask questions. Feel free. Overview? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, you said that you have the projection for the beginning to have, uh, for example, differentness to at a different part of the. This projection is uh, obviously not new, right? The projection to query keys and bags it is linear. Yes, yeah. it, it is done by linear layers. Uh, so it should be in just, yeah. general non-linear because um, if you have a linear projection, what's the guarantee that you add into different part of the input. Okay, so you can think about it as each part of, so what you have is your input, right? And then you can think about it as three different or eight different projection matrices and three different projection matrices for query schemes, right? So each attention head has its own learned projection. And then each attention head will learn its own projection for the inputs based on the information that you want to retrieve. So the learned matrices W, Q, W, V, W, uh, K are different for each one of the attention heads. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm, I understand this part. My question is, for example, when you have the words like uh, yeah, I think okay. yeah. Embedding, mm -hmm. and you just divide the um, embedding and pass the embedding dimension. Yeah, but but you do do that after the linear projections, right? So. You, the linear projections are supposed to kind of divide them into eight logical units, each one for each head, for each attention head. And so you're not, you're not dividing X itself. Yeah, exactly. The, uh, so you're the not dividing projection. the original X. You're dividing, yeah, the projection. And this projection is not as uh, play the rules for learning different parts of the Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Because yeah, if, yeah, yeah. Because if mm -hmm. it's projects uh, somehow similar to different spaces, then mm -hmm. all of the heads learn something similar. Yeah, 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 definitely. So it, it's it, you can think about it as different projection matrices. Yeah. And the skip connection that we have in, I mean, previously we had in encoder decoder style. So here the attention is replaced by that um, skip connection, right? The yes. cross attention that you were talking about. Um, here. Yeah, you do have skip connections before and after every attention layer. So that happens for cross attention. You can see it here. They add a norm. The add part is the 
skip connection that you're using. So you're having skip, skip, skip connections for the self-attention and for the cross-attention, both for the encoder and for the decoder. And as you can see, even after doing the feed forward layer, you have another skip connection. Mm. Uh, okay, so the projection matrices are actually learned. So this is, okay, let's take a look at this slide. So the actual information learned by the attention mechanism is these mappings, okay? So what these mappings learn to do is to take embeddings of vectors, of word embeddings, right? And map them into query keys and values such that we can search for semantic information. So, so this is the actual learn part of the attention mechanism. So it's Yeah, yeah. Not, not in general. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what it does, it takes your input, uh, your semantic. Yes, okay, yes, great. You, 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 you um, that, that was that's stressing out a bit. <laughs> that's just to make a point. I mean, it's sparse. It's definitely sparser than what you would want, right? If you would want to create rich contextualizations and get information from a lot of tokens, then softmax is probably not your function of choice. But then softmax makes a lot of sense when you think about different heads as performing different functionalities, such that each head has its own functionality, and then the sparseness makes sense. So if you're looking for the tokens that are maybe uh, syntactically similar to your current token, it makes sense that you'll take only the most similar token syntactically. And then another head will refer to something else, maybe semantic similarity, or maybe starting with the same letter, right? And then it makes sense for each head to be sparse separately. And then all the heads together have some kind of rich contextualization that they incorporate when you, when you take a look at all the heads together, right? So each head separately is sparse, but then combining all of them gives you rich contextualization because each of them gives Sorry. different information. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. You may ask about anything. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, so vision transformers are basically free to attend to anything, right? So theoretically, a vision transformer could just learn to mimic, mimic a CNN, right? It, it could learn to attend to everything local first. Like the bias could be, you know, looking at everything that is local, but it can learn to look at global connections as well. So this analysis is just trying to show what the vision transformer actually learns. It's an interesting question, right? And the math scores for the earlier layers actually show that the earlier layers apply both global and local information, which is really interesting, right? And then as you go further in the layers, the information becomes more local. Yeah, so maybe that's a better question for Syed because uh, maybe you can ask that via rocket chat because I'm not really familiar with all the graphs here. Um, it's more you know, he's part of the teacher. Uh, so you can ask him via rocket chat, but I think the main thing is um, just because vision transformers can attend to anything, it's interesting to see what they attend to. Do they learn locality or not? And um, what we observe is that they do learn locality even though they're not forced to do that. Any other questions? Yes. What if you take a very big query from CNN and ask it to also find this uh, WP? Would it work more or less the same? That's an interesting question. I mean, I haven't tried it. I need to think about it a bit more about how to make the parallelization between CNN and, and attention, how to create a kernel that kind of mimics the attention mechanism. I need to think about it a bit more. When it comes to kernels, you kind of shift the same kernel, right? You have kernels that correspond to your, the number of channels that you want, but then you shift the same kernel on the image. So it doesn't seem like a one-to-one -one or apples-to-apples -apples parallelization to me, but I need to think about it. It could be possible. What's it? In case you want to visualize the intermediate feature of the CNN, mm -hmm. the CNN mm -hmm. the layer of feature from local mm -hmm. larger models that you build. In that perspective, what are the transformer layers each 
layers and also the embeddings change in the process as well. I'm not sure I got the question. I'm going to get back to the tutorial. So can you come back now? Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. Okay, so we are back to talking about part three, which is a part very close to my heart because this is my research. <laughs> we're going to talk about explaining transformers. Um, so first we're going Hila, to discuss- Hila, I'm oh. sorry for the inter uh, interruption. Could you, you come in front screen? of the- Yeah, uh, your screen is not yeah, yeah, good, I think, and, and you would probably want to come in front of the screen. Uh, of your laptop screen, just like you did uh, in the first section. Is it okay now? Can you see my screen? No, we cannot see you. Uh, we can see your screen, but we cannot see you. Okay, that's interesting. I do see myself on Zoom. Um, yeah. Uh, if you could come in front of your laptop screen, would that be helpful? I, yeah, I, perfect. I okay, okay. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so uh, in this section, we're going to touch on intro to explainability, okay? And why explainability is even interesting, a great question. Uh, the second thing we're going to touch on is why not just use algorithms adapted from CNNs? And why do we need specific algorithms for transformers, right? The third thing we're going to ask ourselves is, is attention an explanation? And then we're going to touch on algorithms to explain transformers. So let's start with the motivation. Why are explanations even interesting? There's a very famous and uh, a quote that I love from Dan Brown. We all fear what we do not understand, right? So in this era where we have generative models and everyone's talking about ChatGPT being a risk to humanity, I think the best way to probably resolve all these questions is to understand the models, right? So we're building these huge models that we're feeding a lot of data into, but we don't really understand what the model actually learned. So the science of explainability is a task with developing tools and frameworks to help you better understand these amazing models that you just built and trained with a lot of data. And here's an example from ChatGPT as to why explainability is so important. So this example wasn't uh, produced by us. It was produced by this uh, article here that you can, of course, uh, take a look at later. Um, so the author asked, how did you come to the conclusion that she refers to paralegal? And then ChatGPT says, you are correct. I apologize for the mistake. She refers to the attorney and not the paralegal. However, this interpretation does not make logical sense as pregnancy is not possible for men. Okay, so here's a, an explicit bias that is really obvious from ChatGPT. He thinks a paralegal or it thinks a paralegal has to be a woman, an attorney has to be a man. And if an attorney is actually a woman, then it's not possible for the attorney to be pregnant because the attorney has to be a man, okay? So even if sometimes we're not seeing the bias directly, and this is the type of biases that I think is most risky because sometimes the bias is implicit and not explicit. And then the model produces predictions that are based on an underlying bias that we cannot identify from just the prediction, okay? So this makes this field so important, especially nowadays. So in the beginning, we used mainly linear classifiers. And then linear classifiers are self-explanatory, right? You're learning kind of a weight for each one of the features in your vector. And then you can understand quite intuitively what the model learned according to these weights. So features that are weighted heavily are important for the prediction. And features that are not weighted heavily are not important for the prediction. And the model was really self-explanatory. But when we're talking about models like ChatGPT, the explanation is not really clear. What even serves as an explanation for generative models? Okay, so this field is really at a turning point right now. And it is really important to try to understand what these models actually work, how these models actually work. So if you're interested in explaining generative models, um, this is not going to be the focus of this tutorial because we're going to talk about attention and how to explain attention. But uh, explaining generative models is really interesting. And I will refer you to a new preprint that uh, I just published. 
Um, it has to do with diffusion models. In diffusion models, you take an input text prompt and then uh, you generate images from the input text prompt. And what we're doing in this work is we're actually able to take a concept, a textual concept, and explain how the model understands the concept. So for example, here we took the concept of photo of a president, and you can see that the model learns to embed a president as just a linear combination of existing uh, American presidents. Here we show other examples of explaining single image predictions. So as you can see, the model makes connections between uh, semantic concepts that are not similar to humans. This is one of the examples that I like the most. So we have an oak tree, and we can see that the model constructs the oak tree as a sequoia tree, just a tree structure plus a stag. So you can see that the structure of the tree is taken from the sequoia, but then the color of the tree is taken from the stag's body and the branches of the tree from the stag's horns. So this is not a connection that we would make as humans, but it is a connection that uh, vision models make. And it makes sense. They connect concepts based on shapes and colors and so on. Here's another example of a snake being generated as hose plus gecko. So shape plus texture. Another example of sweet peppers are just fingers plus pepper, okay? So another thing that we're able to do with this method is actually decompose the concept and find uh, biases. So some of the biases are gender biases as we saw before. So a secretary is modeled as actress, hostess, women, ladies, girls, and so on. Opera singers are fat, obese, and overweight. Journalists, this struck a chord with me specifically because I'm Jewish, um, are modeled as partly Jews, right? And uh, drinking is modeled as millennials, uh, drunk, blonde, and so on, et cetera. So these biases that we're seeing here are not necessarily biases that we would capture by just looking at the image, but explaining the model is really important because once we explain the model, we can see its internal logic, okay? So this is just a side note about explaining generative models. If you're interested, this is a new preprint called The Hidden Language of Diffusion Model. Feel free to go ahead and read it. But going back to the topic of this talk, um, when we talk about explainability, we have two types of explainable AI algorithms, roughly, okay? One is model-specific. And model-specific means that your algorithm uses the internal architecture of the model to create the explanation, right? It uses the linear activations, the uh, skip connections, the, the internal structure of the network. And a good example for that is GradSAM. Um, and another type of explainability algorithm is model agnostic. And model agnostic algorithms do not assume anything about the algorithm. They just look at it as a black box and create an explanation based on this black box ability to kind of probe the model. And a good example for that would be shop or line. Okay, so here's the disclaimer. We're not going to cover all explainability methods, right? There are so many great ones. If we're missing one of them, we're truly sorry in advance. But here are some algorithms that preceded the transformer. So even before the transformer came out, there are tons of algorithms to explain deep neural networks. Gradcam, integrated gradients, input times gradient, kernel shaft, lime, deep lift, and so many more. So the question becomes, why do we even need specific algorithms to explain transformers or explain predictions by transformers. So the reason is twofold. The first reason is that here for transformers, we use attention. And attention is very, very different from convolution. We talked about it a bit in the first part of the tutorial. We have different uh, uh, semantic biases and, and different uh, assumptions that CNNs make and transformers don't make. And then for transformers, the classification is done mainly via a classification token, which we'll see later. But then the classification token is not actual information from the input image, okay? And then the classification is done entirely different than how it is done for CNNs. And therefore, when we try, this is work uh, that we uh, showed at CVPR21, we tried using algorithms for CNNs on transformers and it worked really poorly. You can see here GradCam or LRP producing the results that are really not consistent with the input image. And that's why we need algorithms to specifically explain transformers. So the next question we're going to ask ourselves is, again, a deep dive into attention, okay? Is attention an explanation? And let's try to understand how we can think of attention as an explanation, okay? This is actually used in a lot of papers and it's going to return back uh, when we talk about generative models, so it's an important part. So as we said, the first part of calculating the uh, attention mechanism is calculating the attention scores. Recall multiplying the queries and the keys and having the softmax. Remember that from the first part of the tutorial? 
So we can look at these attention values as just an attention matrix, okay? Each one of these values are multiplications between the queries and the keys. So for example, this is the multiplication between query one and key one. And this is the multiplication between query one and key two and so on, okay? So due to the use of softmax, each one of these uh, rows sums to one, right? So we define a distribution for each one of the tokens given all the other tokens, as you can see here. So for example, the distribution for the token the, in the example of the cat set on the mat, shows that most information will come from the cat, right? 0.9 in the distribution. And some information will, will come from sat, and then the other tokens will have almost no influence. As we said before, softmax is very polarizing, right? And then, as I mentioned, classification for transformers is done mostly via the classification token. And the classification token is a token that is appended to the sequence, okay? It doesn't really represent a token inside the sequence. It's an additional token that is appended in the beginning of the attention mechanism. And its goal is kind of to create a global representation. You can think about it as kind of like as global average pooling of your entire information from the sequence. And then the classification token is going to get attention values as well, right? During the attention mechanism. And at the very end, what we're going to do to make the classification, we're going to dump all the other tokens, T1, T2, T3. We're going to only regard the classification token and use that information to make the prediction. Okay, so how can we derive an explanation from that? The idea is just to take the row in the attention matrix corresponding to the classification token. And when we talk about uh, vision transformers, the patches are just the tokens. I mean, each one of the tokens just represents a single patch in the image, okay? So what we can do is we can take the attention values for the different patches in the image and visualize them in a hit map. So the patches that get high attention values will get red values in the hit map. And the patches that get very low attention values will get small uh, or blue values in the hit map. And as you can see here, we create a direct mapping between the attention values that we calculated during the operation of the mechanism, the attention mechanism, and a kind of an explainability map or a hit map. Okay, so this is the way that we map attention to an explanation. And it seems pretty intuitive, right? The classification token is the only token making the prediction at the very end. And these attention values actually tell us how much information is going to be transferred from each patch to the classification token. Therefore, it kind of seems like an intuitive explanation to the prediction by the transformer, right? So let's talk about why this is not a good explanation. <laughs> the first one is, as we said, uh, the transformer is the beast with many heads. And we talked about having different attention heads with different purposes, right? So this classification row is not a single classification row, but we have classification rows for each one of the different attention heads, right? So we have the attention values for each one of the different attention heads. And how do we know how to average across the different attention heads? We saw both in the first part and in the math score that Sayak showed you that the, uh, uh, the different attention heads va vary significantly from each other, right? They have very different purposes, very different meanings. So just averaging across the different attention heads seems oversimplistic because we don't account for the meaning of each head. And then the second problem is that we have a deep neural network. So this attention mechanism does not occur just once. Each layer of the transformer adds contextualization, right? So the attention mechanism happens in the first layer, in the second layer, in the third layer, and so on until the last layer. So say we're in the second layer. Uh, the token two first represented patch two in the image. But then after the first attention mechanism, patch two gained information or gained context from the other tokens in the image, right? So now T2 does not necessarily represent patch two. It represents patch two and information from other patches as well. So what's the meaning of token two, token three in the last layer of the attention mechanism? It's not necessarily the same patches that we begin with. So that actually confuses a bit the process. So each algorithm that we're going to talk about to explain attention needs to answer these two questions. First, how do we average across the different attention heads? And second, how do we account for the different contextualization in the different attention layers? So the first algorithm that we're going to discuss is called attention rollout, uh, published by Abnaratel, Samir Abnaratel. Um, and they solve the two problems, maybe in the most simplistic and intuitive way that we can think about. They average the uh, attention heads using just an averaging, right? Taking the different attention heads, the different attention values, and simply taking the average of everything. 
And aggregation across the layers is done via matrix multiplication, okay? Just multiplying the attention matrices along the different layers. Let's take a look at a visualization to try to understand how this is done. So we have uh, the sentence, keep it fun. And you can see that uh, this graph is constructed as an attention graph, okay, across the layers. So this is the first attention layer. You see the attention values here, 0 0.5, 0 0.1, 0 0.4. And this is the second attention layer. You can see the attention values between each one of the, of the tokens in the input. And then we wanna understand how much attention or how much information is transferred from keep to fun. So what we're going to do with the rollout mechanism is just track the attention values, right? Track the path leading between keep and fun. And for each one of those uh, paths, we're going to add the attention value on that path. So the first path is here, times five plus uh, uh, times uh, uh, 1.0.1. Uh, this is the first path here. And we have another path here, 0 0.4 times 0 0.5. And another path here, 0 0.1 times 0 0.4. So we're going to sum the attention on all these paths. And this is going to be the final aggregated attention value for the information passed from keep to fun. Okay, so what we did is simply track the attention and multiply along the, the, attention, uh, the attention paths. So really simple, right? And this is, by the way, after we average across the attention heads, right? So we can do that even if we have a complex input of many attention layers. Uh, here you see the classification token and the key to the cabinet. Um, and then we can track the attention values for each pair of tokens, such that we can account for the contextualization between the different attention layers. So what this does is actually unravels the different attention layers and accounts for the uh, mixture of information in each attention layer. So very simple, right? Any questions about that, by the way? Feel free to just reach the microphone. Okay, I guess that's clear to everyone. Um, and then another thing that we have to account for is the skip connections, right? The skip connections in the attention mechanism are really important. So we have a skip connection here uh, between the input before the attention and after the attention. So we can kind of think about it as adding the identity matrix to the attention matrix, basically adding the information from each token to itself, right? Because we're taking the representation before the attention and adding it to the representation after the attention. So how they account for it is just take the identity matrix and add that to the, this matrix, this complicated matrix of uh, multiplications of the attention path. Okay, and this is done to account for uh, the residual connections. So basically each token gets an attention of one with regards to itself. Okay, so they do represent other, another option to explain transformers, it's called attention flow. Again, uh, averaging across the attention heads is done by just an average. And aggregation across the attention layers is done by solving a max flow problem on this graph. But then this method is really computationally expensive and not used in practice. So we'll not go over it uh, during this talk, but I did want to mention it. Um, and let's now discuss the issues with this simple algorithm that we just saw. First of all, as we can understand, the different attention heads have different meanings, right? So just averaging across the different attention heads seems oversimplistic. It seems like you may insert information, say if you have an attention head that refers to background features or features that are not relevant to the prediction, you kind of average them with the same weight as the other attention heads. So it seems oversimplistic and seems like something that may uh, fail our, our algorithm. And then the second issue is that the attention mechanism is given really, really strong and powerful, but then this algorithm only refers to this attention layer, right? It skips the activation, the linear layers, it skips the entire network other than just the multiplication of queries and keys. So a lot of information is lost here. We know that especially activations are really important, right? So we want to account for all the layers somehow, but still incorporate this intuition of using the attention mechanism as an explanation. Um, so the method that we suggest kind of tries to answer both the issues that I pointed out before. So as to the first issue that we mentioned, instead of just averaging across the different attention heads, we weight the different attention heads by the gradients, such that we calculate the gradient with respect to the prediction, and then heads that are really important to the predictions are going to have high gradients, right? 
And heads that are very unimportant to the predictions are going to have low gradients, such that we can weight each attention head by its influence. And technically, this is done as so. Uh, yt is just the logic that corresponds to the class that we wish to explain. So for example, if the class is cat, we take the logic that corresponds to the cat, and we calculate its gradients through, throughout the entire network. And specifically, we have the gradients for each one of the attention heads, right? So now that we have the gradient for each one of the attention heads, we can multiply the attention head by its gradient, element by element, such that the attention head is weighted by its gradient. And now we can average across the attention heads in a way that takes into account the meaning of different attention heads. So again, the intuition is that important attention heads are going to get high gradients, unimportant attention heads are going to get low gradients, and then the averaging takes into account the meaning of different attention heads in the, in the network. And then the second thing we said was that we do wish to account for other layers in the network, not just the attention mechanism, and specifically not just the multiplication of queries and keys, which calculates the attention values. So what we're going to do is we're not going to use the raw attention values as they are, as they come from the queries multiplication with the keys. We're going to use uh, relevance values calculated by a method called LRP. So LRP is layer-wise relevance propagation. Okay, and the reason that we're using LRP is that LRP has a, a unique guarantee as to uh, the relevance values. It guarantees that the sum of relevancies in each one of the layers of the network is constant. So each one of the layers in the neural networks is, is going to sum, the relevancies are going to sum to one, okay? So that's a guarantee that is really similar to the attention mechanism, right? Because in the attention mechanism, we had each row summing to one, the softmax guarantee that. And another thing about LRP that is special uh, in comparison to gradients is that LRP is more stable because gradients can be very high, very low. And other explainability algorithms have actually shown that, that gradients are unstable signals. So we want to kind of create a signal, LRP, that is based and grounded on gradients, but is more stable, okay? It has a conservation guarantee. Okay, so here's the disclaimer about the next of slides about LRP. LRP has many formulations and explanations. We chose to focus on the explanation proposed by uh, our paper, but I do encourage you to look at the paper and look at blog posts about LRP if you're interested. Okay, so let's take a look at a simple neural network. We have layer n and layer n minus one, and I do realize that the markings, right, are not as we usually mark them, uh, but in LRP, because we do back propagation, we mark the layers as uh, smaller layers to higher layers, where the first layers get a higher uh, number. So we have xj, um, which uh, results in xi1 and xi2. And we have another neuron here that we don't really account for. And the relevance back propagation in LRP is done in the exact reverse uh, direction from the forward path, similar to gradients, right? So the forward path is done from xj to xi1 and xi2. And the relevance back propagation is done from xi1 and xi2 to xj. And now let's understand how LRP assigns relevance to xj based on the previous layer. So the relevance of xj is going to come from two uh, components, relevance from xi1 to xj and relevance from xi2 to xj. Uh, you can see here in uh, blue the relevance from xi1 to xj and in purple the relevance from xi2 to xj. And uh, the relevance is computed in a really simple way. We take the gradient, which actually accounts for how much information was used from xj to compute xi1, right? We multiply it by the actual value of xj, and then this is the relevance value of xi1 in the previous layer. And the relevance value of uh, xi1 is divided by xi1. It's just you know, a technical uh, formulation. You can see here the entire formulation in a formal way. But then the intuition is just taking the gradients and then balancing them with some kind of other values to guarantee the conservation rule, right? So what we're uh, uh, preserving here is that the relevancies of xi1 plus xi2 equals to the relevancies of xj and this neuron. So if the sum of relevancies here is one, then the sum of relevancies here is one as well. And then we kind of mimic the behavior of the attention mechanism where the sum of all, of, all, uh, of all rows is preserved. And then the final algorithm is just replacing 
the attention heads here with the LRP value of the attention heads. So we have the LRP value of the attention heads instead of the attention heads. And as you saw, the LRP is propagated from the last layer, from the prediction, all the way back to the first layer. So the LRP values of the attention heads actually count for all the other layers, right? So if we replace the raw attention value with the LRP value of the attention, we actually obtain a value that is pseudo attention, but takes into account the other layers of the network. So the activations and the feed forward layers and so on. So the final algorithm is taking the attention heads, the LRP value of the attention heads instead of the raw attention, weighting them by the gradients, averaging by uh, this multiplication, and then also adding the identity matrix, which is similar to the rollout algorithm, right? To account for the skip connection. And this is the overall uh, outlook of the algorithm. For each transformer block, we do what we just described. And then to uh, account for the different attention layers, we multiply uh, the attention matrices that we calculated here, which is also similar to rollout, OK? So the aggregation across the layers is actually done similar to rollout. And we do add the, uh, the identity matrix similar to rollout. OK, observing some results, you can see that our method is able to actually create salient features that are corresponding to uh, the inputs. Um, also, because we use gradients, right, the gradients are specific to the class that we wanted to embed. We propagated the gradients with regards to a specific class, a specific logic. So if we have two subjects in the image, say a dog and the cat, we can propagate the relevance with regards to the dog and the cat separately. And you can see different heat maps for each one of the subjects in the image. It also works on uh, sentiment analysis because, as we said, the transformer is kind of a, a global architecture employed for all disciplines. So I'm not sure if you can see because it's kind of small, but you can take the same text and uh, propagate gradients with regards to negative sentiment and positive sentiment. And then you can see that the text is highlighted where the negative parts are shown here and where the positive parts are shown here. So for example, positive is enthusiasm, joy, entertainment, and negative is doesn't, hard, uh, joyless, and stuff like that. This actually works uh, quite well for VQA as well. So if we're asking the model what signs are above the person, usually VQA models don't really explain themselves, right? They just give you some kind of a prediction. So you're not sure if the model actually made the classification based on the right reason. So for example, here you can see what signs are above the person. The model actually looks at the signs above the person. So you can know that the model made a prediction at least based on the right regions in the image. What is causing the shadows on the ground? You can see that the model is, again, looking at the shadows on the ground. And by the way, these uh, kind of explanations sometimes show that the model looks at the entirely wrong thing to make the prediction. So these are positive examples, but they're negative examples as well. We do have another method presented at ICCB21, um, which also works for multi-model transformers. We don't have the time to get into it, but I will show some results. So this is the first result. So we have a uh, um, object detection model. This is specifically DTR. And then we can turn our object detection model into a semantic segmentation model. So for example, we can see that in this uh, cat and uh, remote example, the, uh, the object detector detects both remote and cat. And you can see that if you propagate the relevance with regards to each one of these detections, you can get a semantic segmentation map of where the object is in the image. So really extracting semantic segmentation from object detection models. Another thing that has been used a lot by other works is explanations for clip, OK? So we do know that clip can take an input image and a text and then output a score as to how much the image corresponds to the text. So then we can propagate the relevance with regards to the score of the image with the specific text to see where the model finds the text in the image. So for example, this image of an elephant and a zebra next to a lake, we can give the, the model the text an elephant and see that the model kind of identifies correctly where the elephant is in the image. So the relevance map can actually show us the location of the object in the image, given that the model is expressive enough to understand different texts. So the model can show us where an elephant is, where a zebra is, and where a lake is. And here's a cool part of using explainability. Explainability is really useful for downstream tasks as well. So these explanations that we saw for CLIP were actually used for quite a lot of downstream tasks. So this is an example of using explainability for um, text and video editing. So what we want to do here, it, this is a work, by the way, from uh, the Weizmann Institution. Uh, what we want to do here is take an input image and edit it according to a target text. 
So we want to take this image of a woman with a brown hat and turn the uh, hat red. So maybe the first thing that we want to do in the editing task is identify where the hat is in the image, right? So what we can do is we can insert the image with the text hat to clip, then obtain the relevancy maps as we saw here. As you can see here, this is the relevancy map and identify where the hat is in the image such that the algorithm can now edit the correct part in the image and turn the hat red from brown. And as you can see, without using relevancy maps as bootstrap, um, there are many additional artifacts to the image, meaning her face kind of turns red and not just the hat. Here's another example from a paper that won a best paper at CGRAF 22. Uh, it's called Clipasto, also from Tel Aviv University. And the goal of this paper is to take an input image and create a sketch at different levels of abstraction. So you can see this flamingo here and the sketches here are different levels of abstraction. This is very detailed and this is very abstract. So in order to create different levels of abstraction, we can use the hit maps or the relevancy maps for the image and then place the strokes, the most important strokes in the most salient parts of the image, such as the most salient parts of the image get their corresponding strokes and we can create abstractions at different levels. So explainability is actually useful for a lot of downstream tasks as well. I will say that there are many additional methods to explain transformers, okay? I just mentioned briefly uh, three of them, but there are a lot others. Um, for, for example, Covered et al. Uh, did uh, Shapely values estimation for vision transformers. There are people using Markov chains for vision transformers and so many more that we're not mentioning in this talk. So if you're interested, just feel free to check out the papers that cited the papers that I discussed uh, during this talk. And obviously we're not able to cover everything. Here's the list of resources that we use during this talk. And you do have call up notebooks and demos where you can interactively uh, show explanations using different methods and see the difference between methods for CNNs and transformers. Okay, so this wraps up this part of the tutorial. In the next part of the tutorial, we're going to talk about how to use attention as explanation for models like Dino. So let's take a five minute break and get back to it. Is there any tendency of change in the attention while layer to yeah, yeah. So definitely the attention mechanism changes while the layers get refreshed. It, it does something very similar to what CNNs learn. So the first layer is typically, okay, what Stipe showed is that they learn a mixture of global and local information. But then the first layers kind of learn less semantic information, more information that is focused on edges and colors and stuff like that. And less semantic. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then there is research specifically on that that you can look up. I think in the probing section, I probably mentioned some papers that you can look up. Hey. The emphasis about the classification papers. Yeah. Are there any notable differences between the classification papers? Oh, yeah. So there's an interesting work actually showing that you can maybe take a look at other patches in the image and not specifically the classification token and then use the other patches as the classification token and extract the information from there. I'm not sure if it works all the time. I mean, there, there's papers showing specifically what happens in the classification token versus the other tokens. I just typically think of the classification token as a kind of global information about the entire sequence. But then papers have shown that other tokens learn that information as well. And there are papers that didn't use a classification token, but just use kind of a, an average of all the other tokens or something like that to make a prediction. Sure. I'm not sure if I missed that part, but uh, oh. you it shows the framework, it shows uh, how countries, uh, it shows the images. Yeah. I'm just curious, uh, is there any quantitative uh, uh, evaluation? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So, evaluating explanations is a really, really tough. Uh, this is what you're asking, right? About how do you evaluate it? Okay. Um, so, evaluating explanations is actually a really, really tough task. It's not clear how to do that, right? So there are Various methods proposed for that, but it's inactive 
field of research. So we do have some quantitative measures. Um, we do the very simple uh, pointing game measures, which actually mean you take your explanations and then your explanations kind of rate each one of the pixels in the image, right? So what we do is two things. First, we remove the most important pixels from the image. And then the goal is to see that if you remove the most important pixels, then the prediction changes. And then we also remove the least important pixels and test the uh, accuracy again and expect the accuracy to stay the same. So you have two measures, one expecting the accuracy to plummet and one expecting the accuracy to kind of stay. So, so in this number, do you want the main to show what it is by using this quantity? Yeah, yeah, with, with two different methods. And then the better method would show that when you remove the important pixels, it, the accuracy plummets much faster than other methods. And then. I have the same question. Yeah, <laughs> OK. So when doing this, this kind of research, we have to any standard ways to evaluate? Yeah, so as I said before, yeah, that, that it's called negative and positive perturbation or pointing game. It's, it's a very famous paper by uh, Sarah Hooker um, on evaluating explanations and so on. But then there is so much research going on around how to evaluate explanations specifically. So if you're interested in that, that's an entirely, you know, a, a huge field of, of uh, research that I think has a lot of room for improvement. But then, in my opinion, um, my bet, at least for the future, is the work that I showed in the beginning. Because right now, generative models are really the future of deep learning. So explaining predictions is nice. And as I showed, it's really useful for downstream tasks. Definitely, no, no question. Yeah. And then, is it the words or oh, that, that, that's a great question. So it depends on the model. What I showed in the slides is visual BERT. And then visual BERT takes um, the sequence of tokens from the text, appends a separation token, and then takes the input tokens from the image. And the tokens from the image are patches in the image? Are patches in the image, yeah. And is it just like, is it generated as just like a grid on the image? Yeah, yeah. It's just like you take your input image and then you divide it usually to equal size patches. And then these are the patches, the tokens that you're using. You're flattening them, you're taking the 2D patches. You can take a look at um, um, an image's words, this 16 by 16 words, the Vision Transformer paper, where they actually explain how they do that, how they break the image into patches. And then each patch is, is flattened using, using a linear uh, linear mapping. And then you have a token for each one of the patches in the image. and that's that's your system. Okay. And then the EQA model, it's the, the sentence separator and then the image. Right, right. And then you have other VQA models that do uh, cross tension between you have an encoder for the image and an encoder for the text, and then they do cross tension between the information from the image and the information from the text. But that specifically is visual bird, which appends both of them as a single sequence and then uses self Oh, so this is self Yeah, this is self -sequence. Yeah. Why do we need this at all? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so people have actually, I answered that question before. Um, <laughs> no, no, it's okay, it's okay. Perfectly fine. <laughs> um, people have actually shown that the other tokens actually learn information that is very similar to the classification tokens. So you don't actually necessarily need the classification token, but then it was created or it was added to kind of accumulate global information from all the other such as you will have a representation for each one of the tokens that is independent of the task it has. So you're creating embeddings for each one of the tokens that is contextualized from the other tokens. And then the classification token is a standalone token that is just meant to do classification. You can think about it being useful if you want a model that performs multiple tasks. So maybe you want to do both a classification and completion of sentences. Uh, Maybe you want to actually use the information from the different tokens. So you have this token that its sole purpose is just to do classification. On what? On on the average on the average of the final tokens, or yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Is there any work that explores? Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's a, there's a work that shows that I don't remember the name of the work. Sorry, uh, I can look it up if you write me an email. I'll say that I'll mention that. In the next uh, part of the tutorial, you can just email us and <laughs> we'd we'll be happy to answer questions. There is a paper that actually showed that you can use the other token, the not the classification token. And usually the, the prediction doesn't isn't harmed harm that much. So, uh, by, the, by the way, but it depends on the model and how you trade it in the data and so on. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Thank you. Uh,
Yeah, this is from the original Vision Transformer paper, right? It's the rollout method. They use the rollout method. Okay, yeah, that's and also By the way, that one of the authors there is married to Samira, who wrote the role of Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and also, the multidisciplinary group or the self supervised models are they, because you mentioned that they do it in both Yeah. So, for the self supervised, how do you get the that's an amazing question, and actually, Sack is going to touch on that in the next next part. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, thank you, you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I need this answer. Yeah. Oh. Method the... Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hi. I have a question. So, the first question can you also use Tiba for not for a but also for CMS? Mm, it was inspired by a combination of drag cam and LRP. I guess you can formulate some kind of yeah. You, 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 yeah, yeah. You you could you could propagate LRP values and then propagate them for the uh, different channels, right, of the last layer, and then use yeah. the gradients to yeah. Yeah, yeah you could probably. Okay, cool. And the second question, uh, according to your experience, do you think that customers are more interested in their that's another amazing question. I mean, we have noticed, and we will say that in the inclusion part, that uh, different types of transformers behave, behave very differently. So it depends on the model size and on the patch size. And I have noticed that a smaller kind of size for transformers are usually more interpretable, or, or the algorithms in fewer quite well on the smaller patches. So if, if you take a look, not sorry, bigger patches, smaller number of patches. Um, small number of patches, bigger ones. If you take a look at the methods that actually, um, the, the ones that I mentioned, quick so, and they use uh, VIT uh, 32 base. So if you go to VIT 8 base, say, or 8 large, the explanation will, will be much less. Uh, okay. Of course, yeah. Much less, okay. yeah. And how do you, how do you adjust this? Is it like based on your evaluation or you have some metrics? Yeah, we do have some metrics. So um, the metric, metrics are basically based on a pointing game, which is a paper by Sarah Hooper, which I really recommend. Okay. Basically, what we're doing, a uh, pointing game, yeah. Um, what we're doing is we're taking um, the ratings of each one of the pixels, and then we're trying to remove the important pixels and see what happens if the classification uh, okay, plummets. Yeah, and then remove the least important pixels. And, and that's it. Okay, sounds good. Okay, thank you much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, participants on Zoom, can you please confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to move to the fourth part of the tutorial. Hang tight. It's going to be really interesting. Um, moving to Saya to take us to the first part. Hi everyone. Um, welcome to the part four of our tutorial, where I wanted to present some interesting approaches uh, of using attention as probable explanations. Uh, but I wanted to present some different approaches of taking a look at it. Uh, specifically, I wanted to discuss how imposing a clear separation uh, in between the responsibilities of the CLS token and the special tokens and their corresponding uh, attention layers uh, could help us better interpret and explain uh, what what's typically learned uh, in the attention layers. And I also wanted to discuss the role of pre-training strategies in the development of saliency of different uh, objects that sort of emerge uh, from the input images. Uh, so let's uh, try to revisit the self-attention block uh, present in the vision transformer networks. Uh, uh, so the inputs that we feed to the first transformer encoded block of a bit model, uh, the embeddings computed uh, from the learnable CLS token, and also the embeddings computed from the patches extracted uh, from the input images. Typically, these two embeddings are concatenated and then they are fed to the first transformer encoder block and representations are computed and sort of fed uh, through the rest of the transformer encoder uh, blocks in the network. Now, uh, the response, uh, the responsibility uh, of the self-attention layers here are twofold. They are responsible for learning the dependencies uh, in between the image pass tokens 
but they are also responsible for summarizing the uh, information from those image based tokens into a CLS token from which we eventually pull the representations and feed that to uh, the classification head uh, when we are dealing with the image, image classification objective. Now, an idea here is to, is uh, what if it could be better separated? What if we could delegate the, delegate the responsibilities of the attention layers in a better manner, uh, which is what was uh, explored in the um, going deep with image transformers paper, where they introduced this idea of class attention. Uh, specifically, uh, they, uh, they proposed that uh, a set of attention layers will just focus on uh, the image patches and a potentially smaller uh, set of attention layers will just focus on modeling the interplay in between the image patches and the class token. So this is how it would uh, pictorially look like. As we can see, uh, the CLS token is not immediately introduced uh, as, as we start traversing through the network. It's actually introduced uh, at a much later stage. And, uh, and when we introduce the CLS token, uh, the patch embeddings computed in the earlier half of the network, they are kept frozen. Uh, and the transformer blocks after the CLS token uh, is introduced in the network, uh, they, uh, they, they implement something called class, uh, class attention rather than the self attention. Now, I have uh, taken uh, the representations uh, extracted from the different heads uh, present in the class attention layers. Uh, the first row uh, uh, denotes the first class attention layer introduced uh, at a later stage uh, in the smallest uh, CAIG, which is class attention image transformers network. And the second row uh, denotes the second class attention layer. Uh, but basically, just note that uh, these visualizations were taken from the smallest vari uh, variant of the CID network, which which is short for class attention image transformer, bro introduced in the going deeper with image transformer space. Now, uh, one thing uh, that that becomes evident at this point in time uh, is that uh, the different heads uh, present in the first attention layer. Of First class attention layer, they are responsible uh, for focusing on the class specific objects uh, as well as the other complementary parts uh, needed to arrive at a particular classification decision. Whereas the heads uh, present in the second class attention layer, they focus uh, more on the global uh, context of the uh, image. Now, uh, another, another probably very traditional uh, question here is to ask what's actually present in those attention maps. Uh, at least uh, answering this question from a visual perspective is, uh, is being practiced uh, since ages. So here's exactly, uh, here's we are gonna do that exactly. So typically we start from an input image, we then extract the attention scores, uh, typically the softmax uh, attention scores and then we average the softmax attention scores from multiple different heads. And then we reshape and upsample the attention maps. Uh, and then we basically visualize the attention map. And here I'm uh, using uh, I'm using the last transformer block uh, from a vision transform, uh, transformer based model trained using the dyno tree training strategy introduced in emerging properties uh, in self-supervised vision transformers paper. Now, you, you might think that this is nothing new. Uh, this has been practiced since ages, and I hear you. And I also, in fact, agree this is nothing new. Um, what is it? Now, if we closely uh, look at this uh, figure, uh, we, uh, we will agree that the uh, uh, automatic discovery of the semantic layouts for a supervised vision transformer is not that well pronounced uh, in comparison to that of a self supervised vision transformer, even when uh, the supervised vision transformer was probably pre trained on a much uh, larger data set. Uh, so, yeah, and here are some more examples. And on the right hand side, we can see there's little to 
non uh, automatic semantic layout discovery uh, for, a, uh, for a supervised uh, vision transformer, but that's apparently not the case for a self supervised vision transformer. And if you run these experiments across many different images, you will also be able to uh, observe similar findings. Now, here, here, here are two key points here. The attention maps seem to contain the semantic layout of different objects uh, present in the input images, uh, because, but they did not receive any uh, supervisory signals uh, during their pre-training objectives. The pre-training objective was entirely self-supervised. Uh, so uh, as a direct function of the pre-training objective, this automatic uh, discovery of semantic layouts of different objects that sort of uh, came out as a byproduct of the pre-training strategy. Uh, but with, uh, as we saw earlier, uh, with uh, supervised pre-training, uh, the layout discovery part become uh, very sparse. So that's it uh, for this section. Uh, it was short. Uh, and here are some resources, uh, notebooks, and demos for you to check out. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sai, for this very interesting coverage um, that we just saw. Hang tight, because after this five-minute break, we're going to talk to Ron, who's already on Zoom here. Hi, Ron. Uh, and Ron's going to talk hey. to us about some of his very seminal works on leveraging attention for text-to-image editing. So exciting. We'll be back in five minutes. Oh, and by the way, if you have any questions that you want to ask offline, feel free to just email us, any of us. We'd be happy to answer your questions even offline. Hi. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and we're actually going to show that in our conclusions part of the tutorial. Yeah. So for Transformer, it's different now? I mean, we were asked by the reviewers for CBPR to show those exact experiments. So what we did was just randomize the different layers and see what happens and so on and so forth. And we did see that this doesn't happen with our specific method. I don't think it has to do with the architecture of the transformer process. It has to do with the combination of LRP and gradients. Both LRP and gradients are actually using gradients. If you notice the, the formulation there for the LRP did use the gradient of the output for with the first so it is sensitive to randomization because also in the sanity checks, I think one of the most stable methods was bracket, by the way, mm. which was actually sensitive to. So so what we did is we used those methods and we knew that we're stable and we're not suffering from those issues of, of edge detection. Okay, okay. So basically it's not um, to the architecture, but yeah, for, for the yeah. method. The method, yeah, yeah. Because any method can do edge detection, right? But then you want to really explain the model. And then you want to use those methods that you know are stable and will really actually explain the model. Hmm. I had a question about the, the saturation maps. Yeah. So if I understand it correctly, we actually the transformer takes as input patches of the image yeah. sixteen yeah. by sixteen. So yeah. Flat patch. Yeah. And then, so when you calculate the attention map, I would have assumed that your resolution is at most 16 by it. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. So, so you did see that in the attention maps that I showed for my work, where the resolution seemed kind of coarse, which is more similar to Graham, but then Dino works with different patch sizes. So I think what Spike showed here is with a, size, a patch size of 8. So the resolution seems more fine. And then the, the, so the smaller... Image actually had it's pretty high resolution. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And, and and also the patch size is smaller, so you have more patches in the image, and then each patch covers less of the image, and then the maps seem more fun. But then, yeah, you're absolutely right that when you're using attention to explain, you're confounded by the resolution of the image. Yeah, and the resolution of the patches. <laughs> Do people do segmentation with these models? Or is there definitely, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So there are a lot of people who actually took our maps Spend a mass for a clip and create a semantic segmentation from that. So there are many works that actually decide to open vocabulary, right? Semantic segmentation. So the, the idea is to take clip and then extract the um, the maps, the hit max for uh, the pair of the tokens uh, of the text and the image, and then using that, using the hit map, 
kind of create a model that fine tunes the hit map to be a segmentation map, a thematic segmentation map. And the cool part about that is that it's open vocabulary. You don't have to be confounded with vocabulary. So, so you basically you get the detection heat map, and then you have another model that yeah, that, that, that refines it. The original yeah. Image mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And refines it. Yeah. Okay. So my understanding is that um, what people do with like more language models right now mm -hmm. is when mm -hmm. they try to fine tune it, they do low rank approximations to the weight mm -hmm. uh, matrices. Yeah. Um, why do people not start out with really low rank weight matrices? Oh, that's an interesting question. I'm not an expert on that. If you email me, I can try to try to figure it out and try to understand that. But that's not really my field of expertise. <laughs> Don't feel comfortable answering you. Even comments. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Question. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. And I can offset a large number of cats. Mm -hmm. I can take two singlets. How to you, serve? Okay, so, so you do have a limitation, a physical limitation to the number of cats you can use because you have your input dimension, right? Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you actually split the dimension, as someone asked me here. You split the vector into parts according to your input dimension heads. And then there's a trade off because if you use too many dimension heads, What's going to happen is that you're going to slice your vector into too many, to too many parts, and then each part is not going to be semantically meaningful. And then you have this balance, this trade-off between using enough attention heads to gain enough functionalities, enough variety, and then not using too many attention heads to make sure that your vector isn't split to too many parts, right? So you slice the vector. Yeah, you you have the state of vector, this this input vector of of dimensionality dk right that you saw there in the attention mechanism as well and you take it your dimensionality dk and divide it by h for each one of these so you can think about if h is approaching dk you will have a single bit or a single number for them representing each one of them for each one of the heads and then it's got to happen we do have to get back to the video so sorry you can come back later for questions we do have to get back Okay, everyone, so break is over, and now I think we're coming right about to one of the most interesting parts of this tutorial. Uh, we have our guest speaker, Ron Mukadi. So thank you so much, Ron, for joining us at such a late hour from uh, Tel Aviv right now. Hi, Ron. Um, I'll yield the floor to you. Just feel free to present your screen. and yeah. Great. I'll just share my screen. By the way, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you perfectly. And can you see my screen or you see my notes? We, we see your notes. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. No, no, I, I know how to fix it. Okay, okay great. No, not yet. This is it, right? Yeah, yeah, you got it. Good. <laughs> we, we made it. Okay, so hi everyone. Greetings from Tel Aviv. Uh, here it's evening, as Ila said, but I hope you all having a wonderful day in Vancouver, uh, probably eating sushi or watching whales or other, other fun stuff. Uh, really wish I could be there with you, uh, but maybe we could be at the ICCV, uh, hopefully. So my name is Ron, and today I will talk about image editing with diffusion models. And specifically, I'll be focusing on the prompt to prompt approach, which every, heavily relies on attention. OK, so let's dive in. Great. So 2022 was definitely the year of the text guided diffusion models. And I don't think I need to say much about the quality of the results. Like you all probably remember the first time you generated a high quality image using text. Uh, this one was my first. So for the few who are not familiar with these models, basically random noise is mapped to highly diverse images guided by only text through a sequence of denoising steps. However, here's the thing. While these models are absolutely mind blowing when it comes to generating content, they aren't exactly built with image, 
image editing in mind. So let's say you want to generate a cat on a bicycle. You try several times and generally pleased with this particular result. But what if you actually prefer a green bicycle? The most intuitive and natural way is just adding the word green to the prompt and regenerating. However, even with the same random seed, you get a different cat. And if we want to replace the cat with a koala, now the color of the bicycle is changed. And same things happens for replacing the grass with trees or asking for a bicycle made out of candies. So this was our motivation for prompt to prompt which enable us to preserve the structure and composition in the original image so we can intuitively edit generated images using only text. As you can see, we can now easily edit our favorite text. So how does it work? Our key observation is that the cross attention maps that was mentioned earlier in this talk, deep inside our model, control the relations between pixels and words. And therefore, we can preserve the structure of the original image by injecting these attention maps, which are visualized here. For example, we start with this lemon cake. Again, using the same seed resulting in completely different cakes. By injecting the internal cross attention maps, which produce the original image, we can finally get a square chocolate cake or even a square pasta cake. So to replace this cat with a different animal, we replace a word in the prompt while injecting the attention. getting these cool animals sitting on the chair. So by limiting the injection to only part of the diffusion step, we can intuitively control the fidelity to the original image. Here we try to replace the bicycle with the car. So note how too many result in a bicycle, while too few results in a completely different composition. We can also inject self-attention which maintains the image structure more firmly, but does not correlate to the text tokens. Since we still want to allow some degrees of freedom, we use self-attention for only about 20% of the steps. If we wish to add a new phrase to the prompt, we only inject the maps of the original prompt tokens. For example, here, we specify different hats for our cat. So we inject only attention maps of the other parts of the image. Okay. So many editing operations are naturally global, as you can see here, which affect the entire image, right? You can see, for example, the, the reflection on the car window. which is pretty cool, but we can also perform local editing. And again, we use the attention map itself to limit the editing to a specific region. But here is the really cool part. We can even control the intensity of the effect induced by a specific, specific word by scaling its tension map. For instance, we make the hat gradually more floral. I also like to think about it as intuitive fade and control. Here we can make the doll more or less fluffy. By the way, can you hear me well still? There is some echo, right? Um, maybe. Let me just try to move the mic so it doesn't affect you. Maybe maybe it's better now. Sorry for that. Yeah. Sheila, if you could mute yourself, probably that would be yeah. useful. Yeah, because... sure. Okay. So let's continue. So 
this was very cool. Uh, I hope you also think so. Uh, but all these examples were generated. How can we edit real images, which do not just show up with attention maps? So this requires a process called inversion. Given an input image and a textual prompt, we need to find a noise vector which can reproduce the input image when fed to the generator. Then at the inference, we feed this noise vector when using prompt to prompt, resulting in meaningful editing while preserving the appearance of the original image faithfully. So for this purpose, we design a new inversion scheme for diffusion models called null text inversion. It consists of two components. The first is the pivotal inversion for diffusion. We observe that other approaches aim to map all noise vectors to a single or couple of images during training. This is highly inefficient as only one noise vector is used at inference. Instead, we use a single noise vector, but how can we get this vector? We first consider the direct DDM inversion. Without classify free guidance, DDM inversion reconstructs the image well, but it is not editable and the classifier free guidance is essential for our editing. Using classifier free guidance for both inversion and inference completely fails. Using classifier free guidance on its inference is not accurate, but does provide a pretty good starting point for our optimization. So we use the DDM inversion to produce a latent trajectory from the original image, Z0, to a noise vector Z. Feeding this noise vector to the diffusion process results in distortion when the classifier free guidance is applied, as the latent code become farther away from the original trajectory. Inspired by the pivotal tuning inversion approach, we consider the DDM inversion trajectory as a pivot and perform a second step optimization around this anchor. More specifically, we aim to bring the diffusion backward trajectory closer to the original image encoding. Ideal, if the trajectory will be identical in both directions, we will get a perfect reconstruction. So we start with ZT, and for each timestamp, try to get as close as possible to the pivot trajectory. In other words, we perform an optimization for each timestamp where the pivot is the relevant latent code from the DDM inversion. So now it is left to show you the optimization itself. Here's the thing. Fine tuning in the entire model is highly expressive, but inefficient. That's why we've come up with a more efficient approach called non-text optimization. But first, I need to explain classifier free guidance. This is an essential component designed to amplify the effect of the text guidance. It consists of performing the prediction twice in each diffusion step, once with the text condition, and once unconditionally with null text embedding. These predictions are then extrapolated. While all works concentrate in tuning the model or the conditional prediction, we recognize the substantial effect induced by the unconditional part. And therefore, we only optimize the embedding using the unconditional part, replacing the null text embedding with the objective of getting closer to the pivot. So putting it all together, we kick things off with ZT. And for each timestamp, we kick the null text embedding to get as close as possible to the latent codes we got from the initial DDM inversion. Then these optimized embeddings are used at inference to faithfully reconstruct the image. And of course, we use the attention injection as we do, as we used in prompt to prompt to perform our editing. So now I can edit the photo of my daughter. And as you can see, the edited images maintain the high level of fidelity to both original image and target text without any tuning to the model or the text embedding. The downside 
is that this optimization takes about a minute. So how can we make it faster? So if you listen to me so far, you know the answer. We can inject attention again. And this was presented in the awesome plug and play paper where the attention actually fix the DDM distortion instead of performing optimization. So we can actually edit images in just a matter of seconds while keeping the facial identity intact. And guess what? Preserving facial identity is like the holy grail of image editing, the biggest challenge out there. So this is very exciting. And to wrap it up, prompt to prompt, pr sorry, prompt to prompt, unleash the power of attention in user models. Later studies have consistently demonstrated that attention is the go-to editing tool for current diffusion models. For example, it can be used for video editing as well, as you can see here. Another example is Instruct Picks to Picks that uses prompt to prompt to create synthetic data sets for image editing. So we can now train an editing model that can actually edit real images based on simple text instruction. How cool is that? And another example is the inside-outside paper that uses attention to carefully control the relation between foreground and background during editing. So that's it. Thank you for listening. And uh, please visit our project page for more information. Uh, also, the poster of the null text paper will be presented by Danny Cohenor and maybe also by Kfir, uh, which is a really great opportunity to meet them uh, if you wish to. Uh, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Uh, I think I finished pretty fast, huh? Thank you so much, Juan. It was really fascinating. The people here are clapping for you. I'm sure you can see them, but you can feel the vibes. Thank you so much for showing us how powerful attention can be for image editing. It was really fascinating. If you have any questions for Juan from the audience, feel free to just approach the mic and I'll convey the questions to Zoom. And uh, other participants, feel, please feel free to ask Juan questions via Locket Chat. We'll convey the questions to him and then get back to you. Thank you, Juan. So unless there are any questions, uh, we'll take a five minute break and then get back to how to use attention for text to image editing.
Okay, so let's get back to the final technical part of the tutorial. Yay, <laughs> we're here. Uh, we're going to, to, con to continue talking about attention for downstream tasks. So if you notice in, in Ron's talk, he showed some pretty cool and amazing things that can be done with attention. So we're going to touch a bit more about the things you can do with attention for downstream tasks. So as I said in the beginning of the tutorial, attention is used basically in any model today. So also generative models rely heavily on attention, on cross attention. And we'll see that in the next slides. We'll also see how cross attention can be used to correct the generations by a, a texture image model. So we're going to talk about a work uh, co-authored by me called Attend and Excite. And then Attend and Excite is tasked with taking a text to image model and correcting the images produced by the text to image model. So first we're going to uh, present the issue of catastrophic neglect, which is the issue that we're trying to resolve. Then we're going to talk about introduction to latent diffusion models to kind of understand how the model works and what we want to fix about the model. We're going to talk about the method we propose called generative semantic nursing, and then we're going to show some results. So let's start with an introduction to text-based image generation. So these examples were actually generated by LDM, I think. And all these images were generated using just simple text prompts. So you can see that these images are both diverse and very creative and imaginative. So these models were trained on actual real images, but then they're able to produce images that are really imaginative and creative. So for example, here we have a teddy bear in space who is an astronaut. We have this lizard conducting experiments in a lab, and we have Darth Vader riding a bike in a forest. So these models seem to be really, really expressive and creative. But then when you try to uh, generate conjunctions of very simple subjects, such as a cat and a dog, the model often fails miserably. So these are actually results generated by stable diffusion. And we can see that a cat is not actually generated in the image. And even the dog kind of looks distorted. It has you know, two heads and uh, two dogs are kind of connected and mushed together. So the question that we're asking in this work in Attend and Excite is why is this happening? Is this an issue of expressiveness where the model can simply not generate two subjects in the same scene? Or is it an issue of neglect where the model chooses to kind of ignore some parts of the input text to make the generation process easier? And then if that's the case, maybe we can fix that. So in order to understand what's going on and why the model is failing, we first need to understand how the model works. So attend and excite operates over stable diffusion. And stable diffusion is a type of a latent diffusion model. And a latent diffusion model is a model that performs the diffusion process on a latent space. We use a latent space instead of the original image space to save time and, uh, and space. Yeah. So here's a chart of how the training process of a latent diffusion model works. So we have our input image X, which we wish to reconstruct, right? The model is trained to reconstruct the training images. And the image X is encoded into its corresponding latent Z using an autoencoder here. And then the entire diffusion process operates on the latent space, such that we do not operate on the original image to save, as I said, time and space. And then this is actually the interesting part. This is how image generation happens. Image generation is achieved by taking a random latent noise ZT and then gradually denoising it at each denoising step using the text. So the text is injected into the diffusion models using the cross attention mechanism. So the cross attention mechanism actually takes the information from the text and fuses it into the latent ZT that is used by the model. And then gradually the model leverages the information from the text to denoise a random noise latent into a clean latent Z. Once we have our clean latent, which contains the entire information about the image, we can decode it back to the image space to generate our output image. And this is how a diffusion model or a latent diffusion model works in general, right? If you're not familiar with diffusion models, that's okay. We're going to focus mostly on the cross attention mechanism, which is going to relate to our entire tutorial. So no worries about that. So let's take a closer look about this cross attention mechanism and how the conditioning on text is, ha is happening. So here's an example of a prompt and a degeneration by stable diffusion. The prompt here is a lion with a crown. And we can see that the model generated the lion perfectly, but there is no crown generated in the image, right? So let's take a look at the cross attention maps to see if we can understand why 
the crown was neglected from the uh, output image. So as I said before, the unit, which is the diffusion model, is tasked with taking a noisy input latent dt and producing a slightly less noisy output latent dt minus one. And then this is done using the cross attention mechanism, which injects information about the text. So let's take a look at the cross attention maps. As we said before, when you do cross attention, the queries come from the main domain, in this case, the image, and the keys come from the contextualizing domain, meaning the text. Therefore, our attention maps looks like this, um, such that the rows correspond to the different image patches, right? So if we have P by P patches, we have P squared rows, and the columns correspond to the text uh, tokens. So each one of the rows here is going to correspond to a single patch in the image. So for example, the first row in the attention map is going to correspond to the first patch in the image. And the values of the attention are going to tell us which tokens are generated in the first parts of the image. So the tokens that are going to get the high attention values in the first row are going to be manifested in the first patch in the image, right? So then the attention gives us an immediate result as to the presence of each token in each patch. But then observe that each of these columns refers to a single token, right? If we take the, this column, it refers to the presence of the token in each one of the patches in the image. So we take each one of the columns and then reshape it to be P by P. And now we get a spatial attention map for each one of the tokens. So what you're seeing here is the attention activation of each token throughout the image. And you can see that for the two subjects here, lion and crown, we get very two different attention maps. So for the line, we see that the line gets very high attention activations where the line is actually generated in the image. But then we can see that the attention map for the crown is kind of zero, zero activations throughout the entire image, right? So the attention maps are actually telling us that the line is generated here in the image while the crown is not generated anywhere in the image because all the attention activations for the crown are low. So the problem becomes, this is the essence of the problem, right? This is the reason for the problem. The reason that the crown is not generated is that no patch in the cross attention mechanism attended to the token crown. If there was a patch attending to the token crown, then the crown would get high activation somewhere in the image and it would be generated, right? So these cross attention maps kind of show us immediately which subject is generated in the image and where. And now we've kind of pinpointed the issue that causes uh, the lack of generation of some subjects. Low attention equals no generation. So those tokens who have low attention throughout the entire image will not be generated or manifested in the resulting image. So now that we understand the problem, let's think about how we can fix this. And this idea of generative semantic nursing is actually pretty cool. Because what we're doing is we're taking these attention maps and we're trying to um, encourage the model to change the attention map. We're trying to encourage the latent to manipulate these attention maps to uh, uphold some criteria. So let's take a look at the maximal attention patch. We know that the lion is generated in the image. Therefore, the maximal attention patch will have a very, very high activation, right? Close to one. But then the maximal attention patch for the crown will be very low. So we can formulate a loss function for each one of the subjects that captures this behavior specifically. So for the lion, we're going to take the complementary of the maximal attention value. And then since we know that the lion is generated in the image, this maximal attention value is going to be very high and the complementary is going to be very low. Therefore, this loss is going to be very close to zero. But then for the crown, this loss is going to be very high because the highest activation is very low. So this loss actually captures something that is really very intuitive. Take a look at the cross attention maps and then ask ourselves, is the object generated in the, the maps or not generated in the maps? And then we can formulate our overall loss function as just taking the most neglected subject, meaning which subject has the lowest attention value. And the idea would be to try to encourage the model to strengthen the attention for the most neglected token. So what we're going to do is a simple gradient descent test. So we have our input latent DT, our, our input noisy, noisy latent. What we're going to do is to guide it towards uh, paying more attention to the crown, right? So we have our input latent, which is manifested by the queries of the attention mechanism. So what we're going to do is we're going to shift it a tiny bit, such that we encourage the maximal attention patch for the crown to be a bit higher, meaning pay more attention to the most neglected token. 
This is actually equivalent to just repeating this process of calculating and cross attention, but slightly shifting or slightly changing the queries matrix. So we're encouraging the queries to attend more to the neglected subject. Um, you may wonder if this is enough, right? What if we have multiple subjects? Here we had just two subjects and then taking the most neglected subject made sense because we only had one neglected subject. So if we reinforce high attention on the crown, we get better generation for all the subjects in the problem. But what happens if we have three or four or five or 10 subjects in our, in our prompt? We want to encourage the generation of all subjects. What we do is we use a process called uh, iterative refinement. And then we take a look at specific, a specific denoising step. ZT uh, goes into the unit. Here, the cross attention is calculated and is mapped to ZT minus one, which is slightly less noisy. We compute the loss for ZT and then we shift ZT according to the loss such that we encourage ZT to attend to the most neglected subject. But then we compute the loss again. Now say the crown gets a high attention value, right? Because we shifted ZT with ZT tag, but then say the lion gets a low attention value all of a sudden. Then we compute the loss function again. And if the loss function is low enough, meaning if all subjects are attended to, we can go on to the next step of the generation. But if the attention values for some of the subjects is not low or, or high enough, we can repeat the process until the attention values for all the subjects is high enough, right? So this process is iterative. It repeats itself until a certain attention threshold is reached for all the subjects, meaning we ensure that all the subjects are actually generated in the image. And so we have to be careful when doing iterative refinement because what we're doing in the process is actually shifting the latent ZT, right? If you shift the latent ZT too much, you're in danger of kind of pushing it out of the distribution. And you don't want to do that, obviously. So what we're doing is we're only using iterative refinement at certain time steps of the denoising process, at time steps 0, 5, and 20 to avoid kind of moving out of the distribution. And we're doing it gradually, such that in the time step zero, we demand an, a minimal attention value of 0 0.05, which is a low attention value. And then in the fifth denoising uh, step, we demand an attention value of 0.2, which is slightly higher. And then in the 20th denoising uh, um, step, we demand uh, an attention value of 0.8. So we gradually, this is why I call it semantic nursing, we gradually nurse the model to attend to all subjects. We don't do it too uh, violently to avoid uh, shifting the latent ZT too much such that it's out of distribution. And this semantic guidance actually works pretty nice. You can take a look at the example of the line that we had before that had no crown. After applying this guidance to uh, the denoising steps, you can see that the lion is generated with a crown. So basically what we did is we took a look at each denoising step in the DDPM process. We extracted the cross attention maps and formulated the loss directly on the attention maps. So this just go to sh goes to show the power of the attention maps on the guidance of the model. So as Ron showed you for prompt to prompt and null text inversion, you can actually use the attention maps to perform pretty powerful editings and also guidance on the model. Basically, the intuition behind this method is taking the explanations by the model, these cross attention maps that show us an explanation of each subject and where it's generated, and manipulate the explanations of the model. So once we have that tool of understanding the model and how it works, we can manipulate the explanations of the model to be healthier or better or fit some criteria that we can define. And here are examples of some results of this process. So this is the prompt, a cat and a dog, very, really a basic prompt that we saw in the beginning of the talk. So you can see the stable diffusion fails to generate both a cat and a dog in the same scene, right? So it's either two cats or a mesh of a cat and a dog. And here are two different methods that we compare to as baselines. You can see that they both um, fall short of generating both subjects. And even when they do, the subjects kind of look weird. Um, the mouth positioning doesn't look natural. But then when using our method attend and excite, you can observe that two things happen. The first thing, both subjects are generated in the output image, which is positive, right? We solve the catastrophic neglect of the subject. And the second thing, which is something that I really like, is um, the objects are very diverse. So we have different breeds and different colors of dogs and cats here. So we didn't harm the diversity or creativity of the model. Another thing that we've noticed, which was not intended originally, 
is another uh, semantic issue with uh, stable diffusion. If you notice here, we ask for a red bench and a yellow clock. So there are attributes to bind to each one of the subjects, meaning the bench should be red and the clock should be yellow. So we can see that even when stable diffusion generates both subjects, it kind of binds the attributes wrong. The clock is red and the bench is yellow instead of the other way around. So if we notice is when using a Linux site, not only are we able to mitigate the uh, catastrophic neglect, we are also able to significantly, significantly alleviate the problem of uh, attribute bindings. You can see that all the clocks here are yellow and all the benches are red. And also something that I think is really cool, the uh, hours on the clock are actually generated correctly, which is kind of nice. Okay, so as I said before, uh, generating multiple subjects can be really challenging. So here you can see examples of multiple subjects in the same scene and see that uh, Tendon Excite is still able to generate all subjects. So this is a playful kitten chasing a butterfly in a wildflower meadow. And you can see the stable diffusion doesn't really capture the scene originally. But then when using a tendon excite, all the subjects are generated. And also the cat kind of seems to chase the butterfly around, which fits the prompt nicely. Here's another complex prompt, a grizzly bear catching a salmon in a crystal clear river surrounded by forests. So definitely complicated. And stable diffusion fails to generate the scene. But then when using a tendon excite, all these subjects are generated and the bear kind of seems to catch the salmon in different creative ways, which is also cool. And here's the point that I wish to convey more than anything in this talk. What we did was actually take the cross attention maps, those explanations that we extracted from the model, and think about how we can formulate a loss function directly on the explanation. So manipulating the explanation is a really, really powerful tool. Once you understand your models, you can kind of manipulate the explanations to encourage healthier behaviors. So explanations are not just useful for detection of biases or better understanding or deeper understanding of the model. Once you understand your model better, you can actually leverage those explanations for downstream tasks. You can improve the model, improve its accuracy, improve its robustness and so on. We do have another work at NeurIP 22 showing that you can improve robustness of image classifiers using explanations. So explanations are a really powerful tool for generation, for downstream tasks, and also for understanding the model and its biases. Um, so here you have some uh, information about this talk and the paper and also uh, an interactive demo when it, where you can play around with the send and excite and see how it attends to different subjects in the image. Um, this was the final technical part. So we're going to take a five minute break and then go over to the conclusion where we'll discuss open questions. Um, so it's worth sticking around for the other parts of the tutorial. Thank you so much. And if you have questions, feel free to just reach out.
Okay, thanks everyone for sticking around for the final part of this tutorial, which is the conclusions part. Uh, Saik, do you want to take this part? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, so uh, we'll now hear Sayak about the conclusions to kind of wrap up everything we learned during this tutorial. Take it away. All right, just confirm if I'm visible, if my screen is also visible and I'm audible. Yes and yes and yes. Oh, okay, cool. Triple yes. All right. Uh, thanks to our in-person attendees as well as virtual attendees. Thanks for uh, keeping your questions coming uh, in numbers. And also, most importantly, thanks so much for showing up. Uh, it really means a lot. Uh, in this section, we wanted to sort of uh, summarize the entire tutorial uh, so as to give you an overview of what all uh, we covered uh, throughout this tutorial and some I think you're frozen. Sayak, can you hear us? Oh, no. Um, okay. Can anyone hear him? Can, can the Zoom participants hear Sayak, maybe? No, he's frozen. Things like mean attention distance. Uh, oh. And we are oh, sorry. Okay. We couldn't hear you for a while, Sayak. So if you could repeat what you were saying, you were frozen. Uh, from which part? Let's start from the beginning of the summary. Uh, all right. Uh, give me a moment. Yeah, I am back. Uh, can uh, can someone confirm if I'm visible and I'm not frozen? Yes, yes, yes. everything is good now. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, sorry for it. Uh, so in this section, we wanted to summarize uh, our tutorial uh, and we also wanted to equ equip uh, our audience with the open questions that are very much active into the play. Uh, so just to summarize, we of course started with an introduction to transformers and what Self attentions, uh, self attention layers mean in the context of transformers, and then we uh, sort of proceeded to probe what vision transformers learn. Specifically, we learned about tools like mean attention distance. Uh, we also compared the similarities, uh, similarity in between uh, the representation spaces learned by vision transformers and ResNets, and we used a tool called centered kernel alignment uh, to do that. And then we also studied the role of skip connection and uh, the level of influ influence they have uh, on vision transformers as well as ResNets. Uh, and then we uh, had a brief section on explaining attention uh, where we studied techniques like attention flow and attention rollout. Uh, and then we compared uh, its, uh, its, its cons and we introduced a method called TIVA uh, and then we also uh, tried to take a look at different visualizations using these methods to explain different uh, modalities. Uh, and then we uh, studied class attention and also the automatic semantic layout discovery in the attention maps as a way to use uh, attention uh, as an explanation. Uh, and finally, this is probably one of the most important takeaways of this tutorial where we discussed how attention can be used uh, for downstream applications. Uh, Ron gave us a beautiful overview of prompt to prompt and null inversion and Hila uh, uh, discussed her paper on attend and excite all were basically based on the theme that attention can actually be leveraged uh, for downstream applications as well. Now several open questions remain uh, at this point in time. First one, uh, of course, li just like other things, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, so yeah, feel free to take it with a pinch of salt. So the first open question is, how do we even evaluate this explainability tools? And how do we even define what a good explanation method is in the first place? Uh, so there's some work around this area. Uh, uh, in, in particular, this paper called what I cannot predict, I do not understand. 
this paper introduced a metric called the usefulness metric, which basically tries to dissect uh, an explainability method in terms of how, how, how valuable it is to the end user. And it tries to uh, use the usefulness metric in terms of things like how, how helpful it is for the in, uh, end user to identify the source of bias in a particular, uh, in a particular model. Uh, uh, with by using a particular explanation uh, method and also whether or not it helps the end user to understand and identify the failure cases uh, of a particular model. Then there's another aspect of faithfulness uh, to the model uh, where we try to investigate what features uh, from the inputs were used by, uh, by a model to arrive uh, at a decision and we use several methods for that. Uh, now, are these methods actually robust uh, to the kind of state of the model being used? For example, uh, in this paper, sanity checks for saliency maps. Uh, in this paper, the authors show that even with a completely uh, randomly initialized network, uh, the saliency maps uh, extracted using different explanation methods, they kind of remain the same, uh, as we can see uh, in the picture as well. Uh, so what's truly happening here? Like, is it just because of the uh, power of the random features uh, of the neural networks? Or, I mean, there's, there's still, a, there's still uh, an amount of uh, black boxness uh, in these methods, it seems like. Or are they just, are they just outputting uh, a heat map that just looks nice? Uh, and other than that, uh, they're nothing else. So there's a there's a there's a matter of mystery here uh then there's another way to take a look at it to evaluate how good are these explanations where we try to ask given a particular definition of uh, of an explainability method how do we evaluate uh, the explanations produced by it so typically hila also mentioned mentioned it uh, earlier uh, uh, typically we try to remove the most uh, important or the least important pixels uh, predicted by a method from the input pixels and observe the degradation in the accuracy. But then again, these, these methods are highly problematic because as we try to remove certain pixels uh, from the inputs, they also induce uh, an out of distribution data set. So it's truly kind of unclear, uh, unclear to note whether or not this degradation in, in the model's predictive performance, are they truly coming from the uh, from the absence of the important features or or they are simply an artifact of uh, the distributional shift that's happening on the data level so that's why it's still an active area of research then then uh, in this in this in this figure uh, we are seeing two two uh, visualizations of explanations uh, we are prompting two different variants of the clip model uh, uh, with with the uh, with the following caption: uh, a man with eyeglasses. And uh, for the smaller smaller clip clip model, uh, which is clip with uh, a vision vision transformer base sixteen variant, which is which is a smaller one uh, than the bit L fourteen variant. And for the smaller one, we can see the explainability method seems to produce uh, seems to produce a pretty dense explanation uh, but with the larger larger variant of the clip model it it actually introduced some noise so what's happening here are the representation spaces uh, of these two models very different or or is it the case where the explainability methods are actually favoring uh, the smaller models more and then of course, we know that transformers are not just about attention. Uh, they're much more than that. There's a there's there's an entire component on feed forward networks uh, that 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 sort of uh, uh, proceed uh, the attention layers. So we might want to ask questions like, where is this learned information actually encoded, uh, and is it correct or is it? salient enough to just focus the research on attention because even even in our tutorial uh, for the most part we focus just on the attention bit uh, but we need to go beyond that because for large language models it has already been shown that a lot of information actually is encoded in the feed forward 
uh, feed forward networks uh, where the authors interpreted them as key value uh, memories where keys uh, represent the textual patterns typically discovered from the inputs uh, and the value uh, sort of induce a distribution uh, of the output vocabulary. So how do we extend this observation to multiple modalities? So yeah, and these are all the resources uh, for the final section. And I think that's about it. We are four minutes, four minutes late, but yeah, that's about it. Okay, thank you very much so much for attending our tutorial. Thank you, Sayak, for joining us so late in India. And uh, thank you for the remote participants for joining in different time zones. We love to have you here uh, during these three hours. If you have any questions, feel, please feel free to email both of us. We'd be happy to answer even offline. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you. Bye.